Costa on some big items to tackle. So uh, let's get underway. It's 7.01. Uh, welcome everybody to the Monday, March 8th, 2021 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Deb, could you please give us the roll call? Chairman Garvin. Here. Council Boucher. Here. Council Devereaux. Here. Councilor Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. And Councilor Noonan. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Can we um, pledge allegiance to the flag, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indiv indivisible. Liberty and justice. And justice for all. Got a little twisted up there, sorry. I think I said before that will never not get awkward with this setup. Um, okay, does anybody have any uh, correspondence or reports to go over? Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement for the council and any members of the public who may be interested. The uh, Fort Williams Park Committee recently received a first set of draft recommendations from the vendor who is working on the master plan update. And those will be reviewed at the Fort Williams Park Committee meeting on St. Patrick's Day, um, March 17th. So if anyone's interested in getting a, a, a glimpse at what those draft recommendations are, I'd recommend turning in, tuning in for that. Um, there's some pretty thought-provoking thought recommendations in there. I think it'll be uh, make for some good discussion. Thank you, Jeremy. Any questions for Jeremy on that? Any other counselors have anything they want to report on? Yes, I met with um, Tom Myers and a few other Cliff House Beach neighborhood residents just to talk about their process and how they came up with um, their very collaborative approach to parking in that area. I did as well. So, okay. anybody else with anything? Um, I wanted to just take a minute um, to offer on behalf of the community um, condolences to a couple of Cape Elizabeth families. Um, the first being the family of uh, Fire and Rescue Department uh, Rescue Captain Stephen Peters. Um, he uh, served the community for more than 16 years as a member of the rescue and held the rank of captain for more than half of that time and in particular was um, instrumental uh, in organizing uh, a lot of the resources around the Beach to Beacon race. Um, so want to pass along the community's um, thanks for his service and, and our condolences um, to his family. And also um, the hockey community in town um, uh, had a loss this weekend uh, when John Woods passed away. Uh, so we want to send out our, our thoughts and sympathies to his wife and children uh, who are all Cape grads. And um, uh, express our our our, uh, our our sadness for for his loss and 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 wish them well during this difficult time. So, don't mean to start off on a dour note, but um, two uh, important members of the community that I wanted to recognize and, and offer condolences for. Um, so, if nobody has anything else, I'll turn it over to Councilor Gabrielson for the Finance Committee report. Great. Um, thanks, Jamie. Uh, so I'm going to keep it relatively brief because I imagine the manager is going to hit on some of the high points um, in, uh, in his report, and we've got an agenda item on this later on. Uh, but all, uh, the highlights are, you know, in terms of expenses, we're still tracking um, pretty well with our budget and what our budget forecasts are. We've made it through what is, I would imagine at this point, probably the bulk of the winter plow season um, in pretty good shape. Um, yeah, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. Uh, although maybe, frankly, take it back because my skis haven't seen that much use. Um, and um, 
also um, want to note that we have a draft budget. So many thanks to, to the manager and the department heads uh, for pulling that, you know, all the work that went into pulling that draft budget document together. Um, just a couple of quick highlights from that. Um, the initial draft is looking at a, a just under a three and a half percent increase in in the tax rate um, while taking on some of the capital items that were deferred from last year. Um, a lot of that is managed through the use of the um, million dollars in unassigned fund balance. Um, so a good good out of the gate budget um, that I look forward to discussing more um, in our upcoming budget committee meetings, which we'll be discussing later. One other quick note for counselors, um, as well as any members of the public, um, I wanted to extend an invitation from Phil Saucier, who is the chair of the finance committee on the school board. Uh, for folks to attend their budget sessions as well. Uh, they have two upcoming Q&As, one tomorrow night and one on March 23rd, uh, which are both at 6.30. And then they also will be holding the school budget workshop on April 6th, uh, which is also a Tuesday at 6.30. Um, I'd encourage everyone to, to tune in um, and see how the school budget is shaping up. Initial signs look good. Thank you, Councilor Gabrielson. Is there any question for Jeremy? Uh, okay, seeing none. Next up on the agenda is citizen opportunity for discussion of any items that are not on tonight's agenda. We've got right now about 53 folks in our audience. And if there's anybody they would like to speak about something that is not on our agenda for this evening. Now's your opportunity to do so. Um, I'll call on you uh, if you use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting. Matt will open up your mic and if you could just give us your name and address and limit your comments to about three minutes or less, that would be great. And I will be timing here. So if you hear a little timer that goes off in the background, that's your cue to wrap up. So um, first, in the queue is, uh, it's just listed as Magnoli here. So Matt, if you could open that up and um, again, your name and address, please. Go ahead. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Mario Magnoli. I live at 15 Dearborn Drive. Uh, I'll make it quick. I know we have a lot of important things to talk about, but I just wanted to share uh, my concern with how aggressively uh, the town council has seemed to um, push the new apartment developments. Um, I, looking at the comprehensive plan that you collected, which I think is fantastic, uh, you did ask citizens uh, what types of housing developments could you support? Um, when asked about apartments, 19% of the people said uh, they would support new developments of apartments. That means 81% of this town doesn't support it. So it seems as though uh, maybe there's a disconnect um, in that area between, uh, I guess, what, what, the, what the comprehensive plan says and what the town council is doing. Um, and I do understand that you are working to try to solve some, some problems that we have addressed, like uh, we, we would encourage diversity, things like that. And that's fantastic. I think, however, we're trying to solve the problem in a way that is not wanted. Um, that's all. I do appreciate everything you all are doing. You are all fantastic. And, and that's all. I just wanted to share my concerns. Thank you, Mario. Um, I'm, I'm going to take just a second to respond um, briefly, just because the one thing I think I and I don't want to speak on everybody's behalf, but I'd be surprised if anybody felt differently is that your comment started off by saying that the, the council is aggressively pushing something that um, I, I just take, um, I, I disagree with that point um, such that we ha have had one meeting um, on this where we referred um, proposed and requested amendments to the planning board to begin what is intended to be a thorough and deliberate um, process with them reviewing and then coming back to the council with, with possible recommendations pertaining to those um, uh, exemptions. Um, other than that, the council has taken no action and is, is not um, currently um, uh, uh, anticipating 
doing anything, let alone doing it aggressively or um, expeditiously. So um, I know that there's been a lot of um, communication. I, I'm just taking this opportunity of your comments to respond also, I think, to a lot of communication that the town council's received on this item, which we appreciate from the community. Um, I, as I, I, I think um, the, the main point I just want to get across is that um, there's, there's been very little specific action of any kind that the council has taken or, or has immediate plans to take uh, short of what's already been done to refer this to the planning board for an initial review. Um, so that's number one. I will also make mention since it's come up um, that there's a, a, a virtual meeting, town hall, uh, a virtual um, uh, listening session, learning session that the community is invited to on Wednesday. Um, that the developer is hosting. It's not something that's being hosted by the town or the town council, um, but the developer's hosting. But if you're interested in learning more about the project, and um, I, I think there's a moderated way to ask questions. I don't think they're going to be having open mic um, for questions, but uh, there's a way to submit questions in advance that they'll address and or uh, leverage the chat function in that meeting. So um, I think we have that information on our website. Uh, that people can um, check out and sign up for that meeting. But um, anyway, thank you, though, for your comments tonight. Are there other members of the public that have anything they wish to speak about that's not on tonight's agenda? I don't see any hands going up. So with that, we will get to item number eight on the agenda, which is a review of the draft minutes of the meeting held on February 8th, 2021. Is there anybody from the council that would, oh, Matt, go ahead. Mr. Chair, would you like me to do a, a manager's report at all? Oh, I beg your pardon. Did I skip right past that? Sorry That's about okay. that. To, to oh, right ahead. Mr. Council, Sorry. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> Uh, on, on that note, <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to take a quick moment to note a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, let folks know the community services brochure is online and it will be in the mail and delivered, we anticipate, by Friday for the hard copy. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, there's a lot of optimistic programming coming forward from uh, all ages. And uh, I know they're very proud of the brochure and uh, the programming for this upcoming upcoming season. Uh, I want to take a moment to congratulate uh, two officers who really went above and beyond uh, the call of duty uh, about a week and a half ago in South Portland in responding to a shooting incident that was uh, an, an accidental shooting. Uh, officers Aaron Webster and Rory Benjamin uh, responded to a distress call from the city of South Portland. They were the first responders on the scene. And uh, with our officers also being EMTs, uh, in this instance, it came through and saved a man's life uh, by applying two tourniquets and, uh, and with, without their heroic actions, uh, just over the line in South Portland, uh, they would be down one resident uh, due to a gruesome accident. So yeah, he's still here and uh, we have two officers who uh, just exemplify the great and uh, professional service that they provide to, to many. So couldn't be happier or more proud of those two gentlemen. Uh, South Portland is also looking to nominate them both for a Lifesaver Award. So uh, it's an annual award that goes out, and I have a feeling they may be the, the leaders in the clubhouse when it comes to that. So really amazing work, and I'm proud of them both. Uh, with, last week, uh, with last week's change and or announcement with the governor with the uh, changes to the, uh, or I guess you could call it her main moving forward plan, uh, we are currently in discussion with staff uh, on, on, a, on a new opening plan. Uh, so we are working on that to come forward with, uh, with getting things closer to normal than they've been in roughly 12 months. Uh, we're optimistic to, to come forward with a, a, a hybridized opening, uh, looking at the library in the month of April. Uh, we do have some challenges still, and I think we'll see those restrictions being lifted from the governor's office to the five people per 1,000 square feet that, uh, that we run into and our, our spaces are still limited when it comes to that. But I'm uh, more optimistic at this point in time than I have been in uh, probably 10 months since we started shutting everything down uh, that we will get, be getting closer to that. So uh, the, the librarian has had a, a plan. Uh, Rachel Davis has had a plan to move forward with, uh, with the library as far as reopening that. And then speaking with staff today, uh, we're probably looking for a, a town hall reopening for May 1st. And so we're optimistic for that as well. Uh, numbers keep looking in, in decent shape. 
Uh, we're looking for further guidance from the governor's office because they have uh, we are somewhat hamstrung, as I said, by the by the five person per thousand square foot uh, area. Uh, that that does give us some limitations, but I have uh, I'm hopeful that that will also be uh, lifted or eased as we go forward. Uh, probably looking at Zoom meetings for a while. Uh, Though, as far as that, uh, doing the math on the five people, uh, you can you'll be able to roughly get about uh, five additional people in, as well as uh, as well as different committees. If we were having in-person meetings in the building, so, uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I am optimistic and looking forward to, uh, to getting to that place much sooner than much sooner than uh, I was thinking, even a week ago. So. Uh, I'll have a better update when we get to April as well, uh, and more more solidified plans. But uh, to even be thinking of having a plan, I, I I couldn't be happier. And we're looking to get get that back. Uh, we do have taxes due uh, at the start of April, and we do have that drop box, and people are very familiar with that. So uh, we are encouraging people to use that as as they as they have had last year. So that that seems to be a good workaround. But we will have, as I say, for future updates to come. And as they, if anything changes sooner than that, then we'll be happier to, to advance our plans. And that's uh, pretty much, I do have additional items as Councilor Gabriel said and spoken earlier, but I'll save that for when we do have the launch uh, of the budget later on in the council agenda. Uh, just rest assured, I have uh, all of their documents sitting here. I delivered to the council Friday electronically and have you will have them physically delivered uh, by uh, policemen to your properties tomorrow, uh, as well as uh, a couple other reports that I'm taking advantage of the courier service to, to have delivered to you. So, uh, but it's a 200, I think 212 page document is the total total bill on that. So, oh, sorry, 226. So, uh, if you have had uh, need some reading materials, uh, we are happy to oblige. So, uh, look forward to the rest of the meeting, and that that's what I have for this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Any questions for Matt before we move on? Okay, uh, now we'll move to the draft minutes. Is there any counselor that wishes to make a motion? I'll make a motion, Jamie. Um, I move I move that we um, accept the minutes from the February 8th, 2021 town council meeting. Thank you very much. Motion by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? I'll second that. Councillor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Seeing none, Deb, can you read the roll call, please? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up is item number nine, which is number 42-2021, which we tabled from our February 8th, 2021 meeting on the short-term rental amendments. Uh, so first we need a motion to take this off of the table and was actually reminded by a former counselor, um, my Robert's Rules faux pas last month, where we, we should have voted to put something on the table. <laughs> I thought it only required a first and a second. Um, but anyway, um, that housekeeping aside, um, got my trusty Roberts rules by my side, just in case we need to pull it out again. But uh, in any case, is there a motion to take the uh, item off the table? So moved. We'll move. Second. Got a motion okay. from Councilor Gabrielson, second by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? So we'll vote on that. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so item number 42-2021 is now back on the table. Uh, I'm gonna ask if there are members of the public that wish to comment on this. Um, we've got 59 folks in our attendees right now. Uh, before I move to public comment, which I expect we'll hear, um, council's aware we've received a substantial amount of email on this topic. 
uh, leading up to this, um, you know, representing opinions on, on both sides of the matter um, and down the middle, frankly. Um, so um, I just wanted, I, I didn't count the exact number of emails, but it, it was significant. Um, I also want to, um, after having spoken to one of the folks that, that did email today, just based on the volume of email that was generated on this, uh, I make every effort to try and email people back um, sometimes, uh, and I know other counselors do as well. I'm not, I'm not singling myself out in that regard. Um, I, I, just, I just want to assure people that your emails are read, they are considered, and, and, and they are taken into account. Um, if, if you don't receive a specific reply, I don't want anybody to think that um, that your email is not um, has not been read or is, is being ignored. Um, sometimes there are issues, you know, that generate such interest that that we do get overwhelmed with with the the volume of email, and it becomes difficult to to reply to everybody. the The only other thing I wanted to say about that too is, based on the fact that we've been talking about this for a long time, I think most of our conversation and opinions have been made known in the course of public meetings and public workshops too. So while the council is appreciative of, of receiving further input, I'm not sure um, in some cases how much more people had to add back as a reply. But in any case, I, I just wanted to set people um, set people's mind at ease that, that your emails are read. Anyway, um, so uh, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this issue? Um, we've had a public hearing, so I, 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 I'm hopeful that the comment period can be contained to the, the 15 minutes that we have allotted. If you're interested in speaking, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom meeting and you'll be recognized. I don't see any hands going up. There they go. Um, nobody wanted to be first, but Jill S., you're going to be first. You're the first at the top of the queue. And so when Matt opens your mic in a second, if you could give us your name and address and try and limit your comments to about three minutes. Go ahead. Hi, Jill Seaman, 34 Shipwreck Cove Road. Um, I've been on many of the meetings and I understand the direction where this is going. Um, but my one question was about um, people who rented last year who followed state guidelines and did not come last summer and um, extended to this summer. So these contracts have now been in place for about a year. Is the town making any accommodations for those people? I'm not talking about people that have rented in this other um, last couple months. I understand that. It's just the people who in good faith did what they were supposed to do and have extended to then come this summer, um, would we have to cancel those? That's my question. Thanks, Jill, for your question. I think um, we'll probably get to that in the course of discussion um, to, to address it as an answer. So I'm gonna move on to other topics, but I don't, I'll make sure that your question is answered through our discussion. Uh, next up is Scott. Dobos, Scott, if you could give us your name and address in a second. Go ahead, your mic's open. Good evening, Good evening. Uh, Scott Dobos. I live at 8 Farmhouse Road in Scarborough. Uh, I work as a professional vacation rental manager and work with many property owners in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I had one, one question. Um, would you please clarify what the violations are for marketing uh, property for short-term rent without a permit? The ordinance references uh, section 19-8-14 of Cape Elizabeth zoning, which references the main statute under planning and land use regulation, subchapter enforcement of land use regulations. Obviously that's a very, that's a mouthful, but it was also difficult for me to find. Um, I, if it's difficult for me and I'm, I'm somewhat of a nerd, uh, I don't think anyone, uh, especially people it's meant to deter uh, may find it. Um, uh, comments on the, on the ordinance. Uh, what this ordinance will not do, uh, it will not eliminate bad actors in Cape Elizabeth uh, or offer relief to your constituents of who, are, who have lived or are living next to bad actors. The scenario I'm, I'm going to read isn't something I will partake in, uh, just to be very clear. Uh, it seems like an oversight or perhaps uh, not understanding the rental market in Cape Elizabeth, uh, or I, I absolutely don't understand the statute uh, that, I, that I referenced. Uh, the scenario I'm reading, uh, 
assumes that the maximum fine for repeatedly violating the ordinance is capped at $25,000. Is that once ever, once per year, once per two years? I'm not totally sure. I'm basing the scenario off $25,000 per year fine. Uh, a bad actor rents their home for $10,000 per week during the summer. A bad actor has three substantiated violations because, well, they simply don't care to get a permit and ignore the ordinance altogether. The bad actor would get a maximum fine of $25,000. Uh, if you were a bad actor, would it be worth uh, sacrificing two and a half weeks worth of your summer rent uh, and rent 49 and a half other weeks in a, in a year in any manner of your choosing? Uh, what this ordinance will do, the ordinance will eliminate owners uh, that only rent for two weeks a year at a lower rental rate because the permit is cost prohibitive to, to those specific owners and simply not worth it for them. It will eliminate many, and I would even say most, of the property owners that do care about the communities they live in, the neighborhoods their homes are in, finding and screening for respectful and appreciative guests, while at the same time creating the perfect scenario for a bad actor to have little to no market competition in what we would all agree is a stunning place to visit in the summer. Uh, for the bad actor, it would also yield an even larger rental rate than what I was referencing above making it even easier to pay their $25,000 per year fine. I point this out uh, because you're not accomplishing what you think you are by having this ordinance as it's written. I know how many hours and meetings you've spent discussing this and trying to make it work. The hosted stay owners you are trying to protect so they can generate income as homestead residents uh, wouldn't be able to rent for periods less than a week. Uh, you are essentially eliminating them entirely as their rentals don't work the way you think they do. Uh, the hosted and unhosted primary residence owners that live in or out of state and the, and the owners that unfortunately live next to one of the bad actor properties all have something in common. They all care deeply about the Cape Elizabeth community. The bad actors don't. Please don't set up the perfect system for them to flourish in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, likewise, I, I imagine that we'll take up answers to some of your questions, Scott, as, as part of the discussion. Uh, period. Um, next up is Jim Kearney. Jim, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jim Kearney. I live at 1015 Shore Road. My wife and I have been operating our property for four years um, now on the Airbnb platform for, you know, under the 14 night federal casual <coughs> rental maximum. I just want to say you guys have all done a great job of creating the standards and enforcement policies to preserve our neighborhoods and protect our residents against what is now known to be a very few known egregious uh, violators. Thanks for this work. Hopefully the known issues on Lawson, Richmond and elsewhere will soon be resolved. I am, however, concerned that you slightly missed the mark by eliminating the lar largest category of historical Cape Elizabeth operators which is the less than 14 night or casual households which operate within the US federal tax code as non-business or casual rental homes. As for my letter of the 16th of February, there is a way to include these operators as a subcategory in the primary residence unhosted category and make a few changes while still enabling the strict enforcement needed for any violator. This will also increase the likelihood of our residents to adopt the program by financially supporting the STL program through uh, fees, while significantly decreasing the burden on our codes enforcement office. So my simple rec uh, recommendation to this is to create a casual category under primary um, residents unhosted. Under this subcategory, the maximum number of rental nights would change from 42 to 14 nights. And because this would be a casual, not a commercial use of the property, the following three things would happen. It would change the requirement for site inspection um, to optional or random instead of mandatory. Uh, number two, eliminate the need for the costly egress lighting, which is uh, you know anywhere from probably $3,500 to $7,000 per household for people that rent their houses for less than 14 nights. And then uh, I think we should also align the permit fees around both the opportunity for the renters and the cost of the town. So instead of $500, it would be somewhere in the 100 to $150 um, a year range. This would still enable strict enforcement of all the regulations as well as focused enforcement 
of the problem properties while increasing the fees generated and decreasing the administrative burden on the codes office. Without the inclusion of this subcategory, I would ask the council members to reject the STL amendments on the grounds that they do not yet adequately represent the vast majority of respected operators in town, and they substantially increase the administrative burden of our town staff beyond its bandwidth. Now, I don't have a duck in this race. I also don't believe the seven day clause should apply to the primary residence hosted category. I think everything else that's in here is brilliantly done. Thank you for your work. I just wanted to state that hopefully not too difficult change. Thank you, Jim. Are there other members of the public wishing to speak? Again, not seeing any hands going up. Uh, see Victoria Valent's hand up now. So Matt, I'll open your mic in a second, Victoria. Oh, you might be muted on your end. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, I also uh, do hope that you will move forward on this tonight. I've written you so many letters and you've heard from everyone. And I think this is a very good uh, document at this time. Um, if you would remove the primary unhosted short-term rentals. Um, in regards to that last comment about two weeks having, um, uh, not having inspections, not having uh, security lighting, um, I would say that when the planning board looked at this a number of years ago, the first draft, they thought safety was the number one issue. And if you are going to invite somebody into your home, whether it's one week, two week, uh, 52 weeks out of the year, you should include safety measures. That's why the code enforcement officer goes out. That is why we uh, suggested uh, the lighting and all the other health and safety issues because that really is number one item. So um, I hope we don't continue down um, further discussion on something in, in which you're not going to be looking at health and safety items. Um, otherwise, um, I hope you take your vote tonight and, and I hope you do remove the unhosted short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's another hand that's gone up, uh, just says Cindy. So uh, if you could give us your name and address, please. Uh, just a second. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm getting a, a allowed to talk is not available because Cindy's on an older version of Zoom. Okay. Um, can you promote her to? I can promote her to a panelist and then. Uh, yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Cindy, think, hold up. Just, sorry about that. Uh, hold okay. on. Just remember, this might be the same person that we had this um, with last month. So, yeah, there we go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. Nope, you're on mute, I think. Cindy, I think you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Can you? Oh, we did for a second. I think you're back on mute. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, I'd like to comment on two or three things that have been mentioned tonight. Uh, first of all, I strongly feel that by eliminating people from renting who are not there, living in, whose rentals are not their primary residences will hugely improve the situation. I, and also with the increased uh, code enforcement, um, if you don't, I think those are the people that mostly uh, cause the problems with too, running to too many people, not following rules with being 
um, and other issues in neighborhoods. So I think that's going to improve things. Secondly, I um, have hosted, I have had an unhosted rental for eight years, not including 2020 because of the pandemic. And I would like to continue being able to do that, having had no problems. Um, because an unhosted rental uh, is what more people are interested in, especially families. They don't want one or two rooms to rent they want to be able to rent the whole house and be able to use the yard. Um, and it's, it's more financially, it enables you to uh, do a little better with your rental than an unhosted rental would. Um, there was one more thing I was going to comment on. Um, let's see, the out-of-state unhosted rentals um i guess i guess that's primarily what i wanted wanted to say that i think that that with the new code things will improve greatly also is the proposed fee five hundred dollars now to uh get a uh, get a permit for uh, an ordinance be able to be able to get the permit What is the fee for the ordinance that the ordinance is proposing? The ordinance for proposes, a permit. Yep, the ordinance proposes that the permit uh, fee be five hundred dollars. Can Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Did, did you hear my answer, Cindy? That the ordinance proposes that the fee be five hundred dollars. Oh, I can't hear you. Can you hear us now, Cindy? Um, did you we'll Did you hear my question? Yep. C can you hear us? I I think that is a a very high fee to be charging us. No, I didn't. Yeah. Yes, I did hear that. Okay. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna I think on. that's too high. Oh, and the second thing, the the third thing that I wanted. What? What did you say? I, I was going to the three minutes for for your comment has has run out. So if, if we're gonna we're gonna move on if that's yes. okay. Yes. The the third thing I wanted to say was. I don't, I'm not quite sure what a couple of speakers were saying about 14 days of non-hosted. Does that mean 14 days per year allowing people to have a non-hosted rental? I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on, Ms. Doucette, and we're going to, we'll, we'll try and clarify that in the, in the comments and discussion that the council has. But I thank you for your comments. Um, are there other members of the public that would like to speak before we move into the council discussion? Uh, I see Leslie Fismer is next up in the queue. It should be good to go, Ms. Fismer. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about unhosted rentals. Um, do you check to make sure that the owner of the properties are indeed homesteaded and it is their primary residence? Um, so what's being proposed, it's not in effect yet. Is that what you're asking about? No, I'm, I'm asking if you check to make sure that people are indeed homesteaded at, the, <clears throat> at that address. So what's in the draft language that's being considered this evening 
is to make that a requirement. It's not a current requirement. So are you asking if that's currently done or are you asking if it's going to be done should this move forward? No, I know it's going to be done. I just want to make sure that it is authorized. That it is what? Authorized, that it is actually verified. Right, so the, the proposed language indicates that the property needs to be the primary residence that having applied for and uh, have the property doesn't have the homestead designation is what satisfies that requirement and that should anybody um, uh, do that uh, falsely that they're subject to penalty under state statute. Great, that's all I needed to know. Thanks for your good work. Okay, thank you. Are there other um, folks that wish to speak? I see um, Tim had this hand as the next one raised. Good evening, everybody. Tim Hebda, 55 Richmond Terrace. Uh, on behalf of families and residents negatively affected by unhosted STR on Richmond Terrace, Lawson Road, Two Lights Road, Boathouse Lane, Rocky Point Lane, Angel Point Road, Peebles, Peebles Cove Road, Grover Road, Ironclad Road, Wainwright Drive, and, and many more, we ask one last time to please remove primary resident unhosted as a permitted use. Not, not, not allowing unhosted short-term rentals aligns with the planning board's recommendation and is the only way to completely solve this problem and return peace and safety to our neighborhoods. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, we're just about to the 15 minutes of uh, public comment period here. Are there, is there anybody else that hasn't spoken yet that's intending to speak? If you could raise your hand. I don't see any hands going up. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, we'll close. Uh, this will be the last one then. Jeff Set, you're next. Mr. Chairman, uh, ran into the same uh, challenge here. I'm going to be promoting Jeff to a panelist, okay. and uh, it'll just take me a moment. Okay, Jeff. Hi, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you to the council. I, I know um, there's a lot of uh, conflicting opinions about this, and I think you guys did do a great job trying to um, reach as much consensus as possible. Um, I know that there's um, a lot of sentiment against uh, unhosted rentals. Um, I just like to express a few things um, on the other side. Uh, for one, um, I think of a teacher that I had uh, in the Cape School system uh, who um, rented, she, she had an unhosted uh, rental for about eight weeks each summer years back. I haven't kept in touch. I don't know if that might still be going on, but she did move herself uh, she was a single parent. She moved herself and her two kids out of the home for eight weeks each summer. Uh, her neighbors had no problem with it. They were happy for her. Um, it was needed income. And I think that um, uh, more citizens could um, reflect upon that and kind of understand that side of it. Um, I think that the uh, primary residence requirement will go a huge way in uh, solving the uh, irresponsible STR owner issue. Um, you know, uh, the, the people who do have their primary residence here are invested in the neighborhood, they're invested in the community. They don't want to be a burden on their neighbors. They um, don't want to impact uh, quality of life. Um, and um, so I, you know, I, I really think um, there's a lot in here to increase um, oversight and uh, to basically ban a good portion of rentals. Um, and uh, I, I think that's sufficient. I don't think we need to go further. Um, ideally, I think that we would allow uh, a, a greater number of days each year for um, unhosted primary residences to be rented. Um, it's, just, it's not just the teacher I had uh, at, uh, in the Cape School system who really benefited from this. Um, it's also, I, I'm in my mid thirties. I have friends my age who have done it um, just a few weeks a year, but uh, it's been very beneficial to them and their children um, to be able to do that. 
Um, I think of low income seniors, I think of people affected by um, the pandemic, uh, unable to work, um, you know, either because their uh, company had to downsize or because um, they're in a vulnerable uh, group. So I think that um, we should remember these people and uh, also perhaps consider that they're not as likely to speak up. Um, and, you know, so we do have to uh, take them into account. Thank you, Jeff. Can I just get your address too, please, for the minutes? Um, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of my mother, uh, Cindy Doucette, who's at 43 Richmond Terrace. Great, thank you so much. Okay, um, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, we've definitely eclipsed the 15 minutes. Um, so seeing no hands raised, it, 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 there's nobody else wishing to speak. There's no need to ask the council whether or not to um, extend the, the comment period here. Um, I'd like to move on um, to consideration of the item. Um, the one thing I will say just at the outset is that the intention, uh, certainly heading into this meeting, is uh, for the council to take action on this tonight. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about at previous meetings um, was what the effective date would be for the ordinance should it be passed, uh, which was uh, to be July 1. Um, in just some conversation this afternoon with the manager uh, and assistant manager, um, I, I do wanna point out that if, if, if significantly substantive changes um, uh, which is a somewhat admittedly subjective um, uh, uh, characterization, but if significantly substantive changes are offered here this evening, um, then there may be a need for us to consider um, uh, having a vote on this at our April meeting um, with the possibility of, of having to have another public hearing in between. Um, so I just wanna throw that out there that doesn't at all uh, change the potential implementation date, should that be the case. Um, uh, we'd still be, you know, ha have plenty of window between an April passage and a July 1st effective date. So none of that changes. I, I want to personally say, not on behalf of the council, but just on my personal opinion, I'd, I'd rather not do any of this, but I'm just laying it out there so that people understand and are clear on, on their expectations here tonight. Um, so, uh, and, and should that, for whatever reason, be what takes place, um, uh, that there's, there's you know, no intended uh, impact to the effective date. So I just wanted to be ultimately clear on that. So um, I'm gonna um, uh, give deference to uh, the chair of the ordinance committee, uh, Penny Jordan. Uh, who has led um, the long and, and uh, laborious work on, on this um, and uh, have you kick us off, Penny. Okie dokie. Um, I, before I make the motion, I, I really want to stress that the work that we've done has been collective thinking. It isn't just the thinking of the uh, ordinance committee or town councilors. It's all of the people that engaged in the process. And I, I have to say that I was uh, in awe of the, uh, the level of thinking, the level of input, the continued input that everybody uh, brought to the table on this. And I'm not saying that we, uh, I don't think you can ever create uh, perfection or make everybody happy, even though that's what I strive to do. Uh, but I think we brought together uh, the best thinking and crafted something that uh, I think we can really uh, work from. So I'm gonna make this motion. There's a lot of where as is here. Um, and um, so, Whereas the town council, do I have to read the whole thing or can I just say as written, Jamie? Matt. All right, minor technical problem there. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that, Penny? Can I, do I need to read the whole thing or do you want it, can I say as, as written or something yeah, that's like that? Okay, okay. As, as uh, presented in the uh, town council packet for our meeting um, uh, March 8, 2021, I uh, put forward this motion 
um, regarding um, the short-term rentals based on the version that was crafted or written on uh, dated 1-7-2021. Uh, um, using that as the basis for the discussion on the motion. Second that. Seconded by Councillor Caitlin Jordan, and we'll be begin the discussion. Go Jamie, ahead, how do you want to how do you want to proceed with the discussion? Because there's a uh, now, do we want to take sections where people have identified changes and hone in on each of those, each section, resolve that, and then move on? Um, because I had a proposed changes to the length of stay. And, um, and I have wording for that. Um, I guess what I want to, uh, let me back up for just a minute. I, I guess what I want to establish um, and try and have a sense of consensus around, um, particularly because I think it goes to the point of what I said in the introduction of um, if something represents a significantly substantive change, that it may require us to um, take this down a different path. So I guess what I'd love to know from the council is whether there's anybody that's um, planning to offer up for discussion or debate, um, anything that falls into that category. And so when I say falls into that category, maybe I'll give a couple of examples, which would be um, somebody saying, I don't think we should have short-term rentals at all <laughs> and just eliminate them all together, or maybe not quite that far, but um, I think we should get rid of um, unhosted altogether and just have hosted and that be that. Um, those are the type of level I th think I'm talking about, not the sort of finessing around the edges of um, altering the number of stays between, um, you know, within a seven day window or whether or not we're talking about 42 days of rental activity or 60 days or, or something like that. Um, I, I, is everybody sort of on on the same page with me is what I'm talking about here. And, and again, I, I talked to Deb about this earlier and Matt to a degree, and this is not something that is a black and white, like, well, if it's this, then we should, or if it's not, then it, it, this is a little bit more of a feel thing. But um, anyway, uh, tr you know, trying to, uh, trying to keep to the intent of, you know, public's right to know and participate and all that kind of stuff is, is um, where this is, is driven from. So, so coming back to my question, is, is there anybody that is sort of looking to go down one of those bigger fork in the road kind of decision questions? I don't see any no. seeing head shaking now. Okay. So absent that, um, then I guess, Penny, it makes sense to, you know, there, I, I, I believe based on the, um, proposed options that have been requested by individual counselors that there, there, there's about a handful of areas that, that folks want to focus in on and discuss a little bit more. So Penny, if you want to start off with one and we'll just go down the list, I guess. Okay. I was going to start off with the uh, minimum length of stay as it relates to a seven day period. So what I had um, asked language to be crafted around um, it's on, it was page eight. I don't know what page it is now based on the different versions out there, but that a minimum length, no more than one rental use of a short term rental shall occur in a seven day period, except that in a primary residence hosted, no more than two rental use of a short term rental shall occur in a seven day period. So that was getting in that point of, of, of working with um, hosted and unhosted a little bit differently. So are you, um, do you want to, do you want to move to make that I, amendment? I move or? to make that amendment. 
Okay, is there a second for an amendment offered by Penny that we alter the minimum uh, uh, number of stays allowed for hosted properties to go from one in a seven day period to two in a seven day period? Is there a second for that? I'll second that. Seconded by Caitlin Jordan. So discussion on that amendment. Go ahead, Penny, if you wanna talk about your reason for proposing it. If I wanna talk about the rationale? Did you, did, yeah, did you, wanna, did, you, did you wanna go first to just talk about why you're offering that amendment? I'm offering that amendment because I, um, as I start, you know, as I start working through this and I started looking at, it was uh, the unhosted that was creating kind of a, uh, a barrier to the hosted short-term rental. Uh, because we've acknowledged right up front, primary residents hosted, uh, we don't see that there be a problem or minimal problems to non-existence. So uh, rather than see uh, and just drive home one rental, why not look at we're acknowledging hosted primary residents hosted aren't going to present issues. So uh, why not give them a greater uh, number of opportunities to um, rent their, um, their spaces? Um, and, um, and I think that what, I, what we, what, uh, what I try to do through this whole process is understand the different needs and nuances based on how people want to um, operate. And so this was another way to say, here's how one operates. How can we uh, meet uh, those requirements in some way and still stay true to the other problem we're trying to solve, which is uh, the, um, the issues that arise in neighborhoods for unhosted. So that was my rationale. Okay. Um, before we continue with the discussion, I, Matt, I saw you promoted Maureen to um, panelists. Thank you for that. Maureen, thanks for being with us. Can you, Maureen, can you just answer a question for me to clarify um, for me and, and for the public? Under the current regulations, not what we're proposing, but under the current ones, what are the restrictions on um, uh, hosted rentals, if any, uh, for turnover and, and number of guests in a certain period? Sure. So the current ordinance doesn't make a distinction between hosted and unhosted and primary residents, but uh, this is one of those provisions that we have had people drive trucks through the loopholes. Uh, but it was very clear when this was adopted in 2012 that there was supposed to be limited to one stay per seven days. And if you want me to, if, you, if it's all right with you, if I share uh, this document, I can actually show you where that's located. Sure. Or you can just take my word for it. <laughs> Um, so the current proposal in front of you has this provision called the minimum stay length. And the, the language that, that is being deleted um, shall be deemed for a period of not less than seven days, regardless if the actual number of days the property is occupied is less than seven days. So it was always a minimum of seven days. Whether it was hosted or not. Correct. Penny? But as we recall, there um, have we now folded in um, all types of rentals that are sh short term under that one umbrella. So uh, we, we now look at um, uh, incorporating a different class of short term rentals that a, a room, not a half of a house. So it, I, I, is it all right with you if I, I'll go to the chair, if I share um, this document? Yes, I, I thought you were pulling it up. Okay, so I've got it all ready to go. So So hopefully all of you can see this. 
and the minimum stay length is the current proposal. And you can see right here that it says, no more than one short-term rental agreement shall be entered for any given property for any consecutive seven day period. So there is a separate provision in the current ordinance that says that if you're renting for less than 14 days that you don't need to get a permit. But it doesn't say that you have any relief from this minimum seven day requirement. What you can see happening is people are taking interpretations that don't seem consistent with the intent of the original adoption. So I again will say that based on the legislative record from 2012, it was always very clear that there was only supposed to be one rental in a seven day period. And what we've now learned from testimony tonight is that it's been reinterpreted to mean that you get 14 days that you can spread out how you see fit as long as you didn't have to get a permit. Um, I just think that's a great example of why we needed to rework this language and, and make it clearer and try to think of all the different ways that people were reinterpreting things. Um, but it's, it's the council's call in the end. And the other reason I wanted to bring it up, because I, after having a conversation with some folks about this, I, I wanted to go back and check, am I accurate in saying that people that have been operating a hosted short-term rental and welcoming you know, more tenants than one per seven day period have not been following this, correct? I think it's up to interpret. It, it's up to interpretation. In my interpretation, no, they have not been following this. Um, but we we need language. I mean, I think the concern of the code officer is that he's not willing to uh, push people when he feels that the language may be wobbly. Uh, but it's very clear in the legislative record from 2012 that the intent was yeah. that there was a concern with churn one stay per seven days. And I think There's it's nothing here that exempts those folks. The only thing that ex they're exempted from is getting an actual permit. And that, that language does not say anything. And I'm looking for that, yeah. that language now. It doesn't say anything there about not having to meet other requirements. It just says that if you're renting for uh, less than 14 days, then you don't need to get a permit. And I did have it. Wasn't, was, wasn't, wasn't home stays part of, we now folded home stays in under it. You're, you're telling me that they were to follow the rest of the ordinance, even though they weren't considered a short term rental? No, the home stays are definitely a separate issue. The home stays are something where people were supposed to be limiting to two rooms in their home. So when folks are renting out their entire home, I think they still felt fell under the short-term rental requirements, but they did not have to get the get a permit. They were exempt from the permit. And you can see here, a permit is not required for a short-term rental, which with any prior short-term rental does not exceed the aggregate 14 days in a calendar year. So I mm -hmm. guess you could make the interpretation that says, okay, you can do anything for 14 days, or you can make the interpretation that you get two weeks of renting, two seven day periods without requiring a permit. I believe it's the second one that was intended. Clearly some people are interpreting this another way. The homestay is a separate issue. The homestay is an existing provision. It says you could rent up to two rooms in your home and it does not have a limit on how long your stay is, but it, the intent there is, and again, it's that I think is a lot squishier, was really for people who are doing, sharing their house, um, having a roommate long-term. Um, and this, these, these amendments are taking those homestays and pulling them in under the short-term rental structure. And, and again, the reason that's happening is because it was the council who heard who said they wanted better enforcement. It was, it was your demand that you wanted better enforcement. And uh, it's, it's literally impossible to enforce things if people don't get a permit. Right, exactly, 
Exactly. Yeah. So, Mari, so, thank you for that. Go, go ahead. No, I just want to say thank you. What, the only reason I'm bringing this up is to point out, because, and you beat me to the punch on the homestay thing, because that was my next question on the number of rooms. But the, the point being that, number one, I think this underscores why it's so important that we're being much more precise in how we're characterizing things um, and, um, and laying them out now, as opposed to what was in some cases rather vague and ambiguous previously. So I think that's good. Um, but the, the other reason I bring it up is I, I think there's been a little bit of a, a um, feeling like something is being stripped away from folks that are doing hosted rentals. And my, my reading of this was, was that maybe that's not the case. And, and in some cases, some of those folks may have been operating outside the boundary of, of the previous regulation to begin with. Am, am I accurate in that or not? Is that a question to me? Uh, you or anyone, frankly, but. That's not my interpretation. But... My... Go ahead, Caitlin. Well, I just, I had the same recollection as Penny. When we put this forward, I thought basically homestays were primary hosted and they didn't have to follow the seven day. So that's why, I mean, I, I felt like we we're stripping away that homestay right that they've been operating under. I mean, it was my understanding that they weren't in violation, but now Maureen's saying that they have been, but I, I don't think that was the intent so many years ago. I, I wanna make sure, I'm not, I, I don't think we can say that the people uh, in the homestays were in violation if they were limiting their rentals to this current definition. Uh, but we have had people testify that in fact they were renting more than two rooms. And that I think is even beyond what was the, I mean, the homestay definition that we have right now is here that says it's accessory and incidental it provides one or two furnished bedrooms for rent to guests. So if you were going beyond that, then yeah, you were violating the homestay. If you were not going beyond that, um, then, then you were not violating the homestay. And I don't wanna make it sound like they were absolutely violating. I wanna say that I think there was um, an expectation that the homestay, when we put it in, we put it in as part of the bed and breakfast <laughs> amendments. And it was really an expectation that was really going to be legitimizing roommates. Um, so, but we didn't put that in clearly. But the whole one to two bedrooms is definitely clear. Uh, and if you're renting at any time more than one or two, more than two bedrooms, then you went beyond the homestay definition. Um, and if you were adding kitchenettes, you definitely went beyond the homestay definition. Right, but the Valerie, people. Okay. Come to you in a second, I, Valerie. I see your hand. Thank but you, Caitlin. Hold on, Valerie, because Caitlin, Caitlin had her hand up too before you. Before this, I just want to. Did you, did you I, get talk about everything you wanted to, Caitlin, or no? just the, the the people that we've been hearing from that are asking for the primary hosted basically have been operating the homestays, and from what I'm reading in all of their emails is they've been. For the most part following these rules so what penny's trying to propose and i support is just trying to make it so that they can continue for the most part doing things that they've been doing that's all put my hand okay. down now thanks Councilor deborah um i i agree i think we're kind of getting off into the weeds about what was written before because we're talking now about penny's um Penny's motion, and I, I think that um, the hosted homestays, and we're calling them hosted now, need to either say no time limit at all or have the, the twice a week, which is what Penny's talking about. Because my concern is, is it going to be more difficult to enforce it if we say two turnovers a week or if we say no limitation at all? That's my um, my question because I think that um, the homestays have hosted have been going fine. We haven't had any problems with it. I don't want to overregulate it. Maureen, do you I totally think? Agree. 
That'd be more. Could, to... Go ahead, Jamie. Well, I, I, I want to say I totally agree with you, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to take us off on a tangent. I, I think what I'm trying to articulate, though, and 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 uh, lay the context for, is that some of the impetus for proposing this, it was suggested that, um, again, things were being taken away from this particular category. And when I went back and read it more closely from the existing language, I said, well, wait a minute. I'm not, you know, depending on how you interpret it, I'm not, I'm not sure anything was being taken away. So that's all. And so I, I don't disagree with you that in, in matter of practice, um, you know, we've, we've all been talking about the need for streamlining and simplification and all that kind of stuff. My only point was this was brought forward because some folks were saying, hey, you're taking away these privileges that we previously had. And when I went and looked at it more closely, I questioned whether or not that was actually the case. That's all. Is there other discussion on Penny's uh, amendment that's on the table? It's Go Gretchen. Ahead, yep, I just, um, I have the same question that Valerie has just about whether it would actually be easier to enforce if we didn't put any cap on it or if, um, so I don't know if Maureen can speak to that or, but just for the um, hosted, obviously. I, I can't speak to that. I, I don't know. Go ahead, Penny. I just wanted to say that um, I I agree and I appreciate Valerie's uh, suggestion on that. Uh, that why have a why have a limit at all? We're hosted. Agree. Yep. Other discussion. Um, Jamie, sorry, I don't know Go if ahead. you can see my hand raised. Um, yeah. um, I, so I, I guess one question I have on that is, are you are, are people proposing eliminating the limit on the number of rentals per week or on the 42 nights? Um, and I think those are two separate questions. I would also, I, I just point out, there is a point even with unhosted at which um, turnover does become uh, a, a, something of an issue. I, I mean, we, we have a separate, we have a separate, category in our land use ordinance for people who are renting out multiple bedrooms on a nightly basis, and we call them bed and breakfasts. And there are numerous standards that are enumerated in our land use code for where those should be cited based on, you know, the, the planning board, the, you know, the, the planning boards those, and the zoning ordinances, you know, requirements for how those impact neighbors. So I think there is a point at which unhosted, unrestricted nightly rentals tips over into a different type of land use that merits some greater scrutiny. We're talking hosted. We're only talking about hosted right now. Fair, fair enough, but I mean, a bed and breakfast is a hosted short-term rental, essentially. I mean, every bed and breakfast I've ever stayed at is. Right. Um, so I think, you know, I think I, if it's, if it's a matter of limiting the number of times per week, but keeping to that overall cap, I could, I could maybe support that. But if we're just doing away with the restrictions, I think we're really talking about another land use altogether there. But host, unhosted is treated differently than hosted. Um, if I said unhosted, I misspoke. I, I, what okay. I meant, what I meant was the, okay. the un, was the hosted. Excuse me. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you. A bed and breakfast also allows nine rooms versus this would only allow two. Correct. Oh. Up to. Yeah. Other discussion. I, I guess my question then to Penny is, um, do you want to move forward with the motion having it um, twice a week or would you wanna move forward with the motion removing the seven days for hosted, the seven day limitation? 
Uh, I like Jeremy's argument, that's my thing. Um, I'm gonna stay with the two. It's a good call. Other discussion on the amendment that's been proposed to allow for two guest stays in a seven day period for hosted. Okay, uh, seeing no further discussion on that, uh, can we call a question on the amendment? Deb. Councilor Boucher. Oh. Oh. Just language wise, are, what are we, are we just voting on putting an amendment in of it? Are we gonna clean up the language for the next vote? Uh, I, I thought you had that in the option. I, th I think we already had it, right? My only thing is there's a little, there's some more language that I think needs to be cleaned up that's still in there. Like when you go down to the definition of primary hosted, the last sentence says that each short-term rental tenant must comply with the minimum seven day stay requirement, which basically it's not anymore. So that would need to come out. The was, last, that put, was that was that was that put in option three? I I think I'm looking at version I'm looking at version two, which is that option three. No, they they got all. No, there was another piece that was option three. There there's a spot about advertising that oh, okay, did that the wording good. didn't sorry. match with the seven day thing. So that's another place that it all just needs to match. The, the last sentence of where we have permitted short-term rentals applicability. Which, which page and line are you on? Katie? Page six, line 28. Where it says primary residence hosted. The last sentence specifically says that those have to comply with the minimum seven day stay. Like why that sentence is on that one, but not the primary residence unhosted or either of the others. I'm just saying we're literally taking that out of that one and that's the only one that has it. Yeah, I flagged that on my notes that that line should probably just be removed because it's right. Yeah, I saw that, that you did that. That's why I thought it was gone. Okay. That's right. Just before we voted, I wanted to know if we were voting yeah. on, on what exactly that was all putting some language in and then we we're going to take some language out later or. Um. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Maureen, yeah. do you have any do you have any guidance on just reconciling throughout the document? I I honestly think you need to either give me a list and have me bring it back to you next month, or we have to sit here tonight and me revise every piece and have you vote on each section. Because this right here, the reason this this line was put in here and not in any of the other provisions is because the other provisions have these day caps. And if you don't put this in, it says no limit on the total number of days operated as a short-term rental, which would actually conflict with your minimum stay paragraph. That's why everything in here has kind of a cascade effect. Um, if you, just took out this seven day stay, um, you could have someone say that, oh, well this, this sentence above means I don't have to follow the set the minimum stay requirements at all. So that's why this, this sentence was added. Um, and if you wanna make these changes, we're, we're gonna have to really tiptoe through the tulips here. <laughs> Can we just have it say with the minimum consecutive day stay requirement or something like that? We can change it because I believe that the name of that other paragraph is the minimum stay and we can minimum, we can say it has to comply with the minimum stay length requirement. Okay. So that's one way to do it. But again, do you want me to start making these changes now or do you want to vote in each one? 
But here, hold on. So here's the problem though, Maureen, and this is what you and I were speaking about earlier today, is that it's not a minimum stay requirement. It's a, it, it, the, the, the language as it's worded, as, as you just read it, nobody can be compelled to stay for a minimum amount of time. Right. The, the property can only be available to rent for a minimum amount of time. Right. So I have trouble with that language in so much as it, it obligates somebody to stay for a period of time that they, that no one can be reasonably obligated to. So this is a heading for this paragraph change we can change the name of it it's just it's just a short reference to what we're talking about and then you go into it and you can see right here that it says there's well there's the less than 30 days but there's there's um there's a less than seven day requirement right here the property shall be remain vacant for remaining portion of the seven day period so if you're uncomfortable with calling this minimum stay length, we can call it maximum rental period. intensity. Um, period, period, period. Event. Keeping along those lines. But again, this, these words are used multiple times throughout the draft. Yep. Caitlin? Yes. Your hands up. Oh, sorry. I put it down. Okay. Jamie, um, I think I think we hit that point where um, do we do we want to move the motion on the change and then because it cascades through the document that we ha have to then have um, another uh, workshop to go over those cascading and move to, not that I wanted to do this, move to the April meeting. Because if we wordsmith throughout this meeting, we're gonna, it's just gonna become messy and we won't know what we're voting on. Yeah, I'm, um, I I agree with you that we're getting quickly down a rabbit hole here, which is frustrating, um, and I don't think is going to make for um, a good amount of productivity, uh, particularly given the rest of our agenda. Um, In the, in the time we have remaining on this item and uh, given what we've, what I'm, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to thread the needle on here is whether or not there's a, there's a way for us to effectively use this time to discuss people's general feeling and position on things. We do the necessary work to clean up the language and then bring that back. So almost almost use this as, as I don't want to say a working session, but it, it, does everybody understand what I'm driving towards? Yes. Um, Matt, do you have any opinion that you want to offer up? If it may be helpful, Mr. Chairman, uh, one thought may be that If you do, we could we could we could schedule another workshop. I don't think what you're looking at would be substantive changes uh, when it comes to the ordinance side of it, or at least the amendments. It it sounds like it's mostly linking where there are subtle changes to bring that forward. Uh, the next option would be to on the on item number 43, which is the next item uh, relating to the comprehensive plan. If you moved forward with that part of it, at least you would you would run out of some or or you would stay away from some of the conflicts that you had as far as noticing and having to have uh, additional uh, time periods involved. So, uh, and then you could come back and bring this for the April meeting and have, uh, and have it for action there. Uh, yeah. that, that would be helpful because that would give you that time to, you know, to go through and find those linkages where they are applied 
and then make those changes and see if they, it doesn't sound like any of these are really uh, paradigm shift moments. They're mostly making a subtle change here, you know, going from one to two or a number of days perhaps uh, that aren't really changing the language, but making sure that the language is, is where there are connections that they, those connections are, are uh, honored. <clears throat> Maureen, are you just enumerating these? I'm trying to got? capture what I think you've been talking about. And, and if, you know, I thought if we just did like a really quick list, you might be able to come to consensus on that. And then I can bring back um, revisions. I have the first option was to uh, increase the number of uh, guests that could come to a uh, hosted from one stay every seven days to two stay every seven days. I'm seeing nods. So should I make that, should I incorporate that? Yes. I'm, I'm looking to you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I'm sorry, not in my head, yeah. Okay, good. Second one was, um, change the, okay, the minimum stay paragraph. You didn't like the name of that. I'm gonna go back and fix that. Well, it, it's not, it's, it's just so I'm clear and I'm not trying to, it, it, again, it, I'm, I'm not trying to um, be difficult about about it, but what what I, I think the, the language in throughout needs to be from the, the viewpoint and the perspective of is more the operator who's offering that property, not, the, the tenant or guest um, who who's, is staying there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Like the, the voice that it's in should be reflective of, because that's the person who's- who Is it like maximum, maximum rental availability? Right, because that's the, that's the person who has to, you know, apply for and uphold the um, components of the permit, not the, the tenant has no obligation whatsoever in this. And then the advertising item, that was the, the option three. Um, yeah, so that's just, it, this goes along with the wording for everything else. Cause right <coughs> now it says uh, advertising of the short-term rental must state that the short-term rental must be rented for a minimum period of seven consecutive days. So it's, it's just matching that wording to everything else. So that basically would, I mean, if, if then I'm just gonna be having to delete that line. And that means, just so you're aware, that means that if um, a short-term rental operator advertises a nightly rate, um, people are just gonna have to live with that. And we're gonna have to hope that the operator is honoring the no more than two times a week. So one thing that um, for everybody else's benefit, one thing that Maureen and I discussed this afternoon um, is that we come up with some sort of standard boilerplate language that in addition to the requirement that the permit number be included in the, um, uh, in the listing, that there be some sentence or two that's included in every, that every operator would have to include in their listing that just makes reference to um, you know, Cape Elizabeth regulations require that there be no more than, you know, one booking within a seven day period, you know, regardless of the number of days that you as a, you know, you as a guest are booked for. Okay, that's fine. I just whatever, didn't want it. To... Whatever we land on for that language, but that, that we have that be a requirement that it be included in, in the booking listing. Okay, th that's why I flagged it because it just said a minimum rental period of seven days. So if someone saw that in a listing, they would think, oh, I have to pay for six nights or. Right. Penny, were you gonna say something? You're on mute. No, my screen went blank. Oh, okay. It's back now. And then I think the option four was a recommendation to increase the 
cap on the primary residence unhosted to 105 days. Is that the one that's 42 right now? Correct. Okay. So before we go having Maureen change any of those things, I guess I, I, what I'd love to do, what I, I had hoped we could have done this already, I guess is, uh, um, um, so it's imperative that whether we do it now or we do it at our to be scheduled workshop to continue this, that we need to land on the language, okay? Because we can't, we can't have another meeting like this where we're um, going into this level of minutia on these things and, and writing it on the fly. It's, it's, it's not a good practice. Um, so if, if, if we're not, if, if we opt not to do it right now to get an understanding from folks on where they stand on some of these things, because I don't want Maureen to be coming back with three, four options on different things. And, oh, are we doing option one? Are we doing, what, what I would like us to do is get to some level of consensus on each of these outstanding questions so that we can tighten up and write the language in a way that reflects what I expect to be the, you know, majority opinion of everybody. And then we're actually voting on final language when that, when that point comes. Um, and if, if we have to make a, a, a very subtle or minor tweak to something at that point, that's, Fine, that's acceptable, but we, we can't be doing what we're doing right now. Um, Penny? Quick, Penny, uh, Jamie, that sounds great, uh, but we do have a motion on the table. Uh, I understand. That's been yeah. Seconded, do uh, we need to take care of that first? Just withdraw the motion. No, I, here's what I, here's my opinion. It's that motion that ripples that ripples through this. So if, if we leave here tonight without having reached um, a vote or consensus or whatever on that motion, what we're gonna do is gonna be back at the table with nothing driving the changes that need to go down through this document. That's my opinion. You need, you need the anchor to cause the ripple effect to happen. Mr. Chairman, if it, if it, may, if it may be helpful, uh, if the council takes action on the amendment, that would amend the initial motion, uh, and then you could come back afterwards and then take up that item as amended uh, for action. And then you, you would have subsequent amendments that would have to take place, but I would I, I think that Councillor Jordan is is proper in her in her analysis. Say that again. I, I didn't fully follow what you were saying. Yes, yeah, so if you if you take action on this amendment, uh, Councillor Jordan is 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 correct in her analysis that then that would you know you still have the initial motion that was made uh, to get the ball rolling by Council Jordan and then uh, on the initial part and then it, the, the council would then have to take action on the original motion as amended and then uh, these other these others would flow through so uh, you would have that language cleaned up and ready for action uh, at, at a subsequent meeting so okay. I was just saying, I think basically we vote on Penny's motion and then table the original motion so that we can have all the changes for next month and then just take up the tabled item again and vote it right then. Yes. Um, I, I, I get that. I think it leaves unanswered though some of these other questions that are not directly related to the question of multiple stays in a seven day period at a hosted property that again, I, I, 
I think it would be counterproductive for us to have not given more concrete direction based on where um, where we think the majority opinion lies on these questions such that we can tighten up the language so that we're just voting that up or down. So we do the same process. Penny initiated an amendment for one of those items. We vote that amendment. Somebody initiate an amendment for another item, vote that amendment. Mm -hmm. Then you table the whole thing, clean up the language, come back with all the language put in and vote it through. No more discussion. Okay. I think that makes sense. Awesome. Yep. Um, all right, let's, let's try and get this tracked then. So the amendment on the table currently is to change the requirement um, from one booking in a seven day period to two bookings in a seven day period for a primary residence hosted short term rental. Is there any other discussion on that amendment? Caitlin, your hand is just still up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, now it's back up again. <laughs> um, okay, Deb, why don't we do a roll call on that amendment? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? No. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The amendment carries six yay, one nay. Okay. So following on that, is there anyone else that wants to offer up an amendment for discussion? Can Maureen go back to her little list she made? I um, I brought forward the idea. I was looking at the um, the unhosted adjacent. Basically, says um, a hundred and five days for unhosted adjacent. And looking at that. Um, I, I was thinking that the unhosted adjacent and unhosted rental should be um, consistent. One of them is 42 days, one is 105 days. Um, I would propose both of them at 105 days because in that, um, in that category, we're also going to have people visiting. So if you, what we've what? Up, right, we've set it up so that if you have an unhosted short term rental and you have um, friends using using your place, even though you're not really renting it, that counts as part of your days. Uh, so I, I'm just thinking we need to have it where it's consistent that they're both the same. Caitlin? So I guess. I might be lost, but I don't think there is an unhosted adjacent. The adjacent, they have to be home next door. Am I missing a whole category? It's called, it's called um, short-term rental adjacent. Right, yeah. and the adjacent property, they have to be home. So there's no unhosted 
They're just next door. They're hosted next door. Right. There's nothing, there's nothing requiring them to be home. It's, they must be in residence during the tendency of the short-term rental. So like, yeah, I mean, it, it, out, but I mean. That's what I mean. That's, I just want to be clear that they don't have to be on site is all. I, but. I suppose, right, but you don't have to be on site when you're hosting either. I mean, you could go out to dinner or. I, I'm just trying to be clear in the language, that's all. Me, yep. I'm just saying I, I, I didn't read it as being unhosted i guess i didn't see there being a, an adjacent hosted and an adjacent unhosted it's just so if uh if um, I, I think what valerie's valerie's trying to do is simplify so if um and caitlin was right on the money um then should the um adjacent be the same as uh Posted from a um, a number of calendar days. If what if what we're trying to do is one one is trying to do is create uh, consistency. Afternoon. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, Penny, but I, I was going to say, I, I'm afraid I disagree with Val. I just think that the adjacent, which I'll be honest, it's not a category that I'm entirely a fan of as it is, but um, I think I think of it as more of like a hosted situation. So I wouldn't want to, in order to create equity, raise the number of days for unhosted because I, I think 42 should be the max. I, I would actually I'm not that I'm going to do this right now, but I would rather see it be like four weeks. So I personally am not in favor of raising the number for the unhosted. Um, as to Penny's question, I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about that one, but I see what you're saying. Valerie, did you make a motion? No, not yet. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, um, Curious if anybody supports that or if everybody's against it. Uh, I think that it would be nice to see it all consistent. I agree with the consistency, but I am more inclined to make it match to 42 than to make it match to 105. I think they should stay as they are. I have no problem approving it how it is, but if we were going to match. So okay. does anybody have a motion or on this or something else then? No, it sounds like um... Everybody wants to leave it the way it is, so we'll leave it that way. So there were there were other things in the list. I guess um, what I'm trying to discern on some of this list is whether or not it's something that we want to vote on as an amendment or it's just a matter, some of these things are, are just some of the cleanup things that we talked about, so. Would the advertising boilerplate be an amendment because that's new? Um, Maureen, could you scroll to the section where we talk about the requirement for um, having the permit in the advertising listing? Uh, no, no. I 
Oh yeah, right there, right, right ahead of it. Must include the short-term rental permit number. Um, So I just think, I mean, I just think we need to come up with revised language here. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's something to vote on tonight, but or or requires an amendment. But um, so, Jamie, I, I think one one thing that we could do, and I'll, I can offer this as an amendment, is that we change the the heading of the next paragraph, minimum length of stay, from minimum length of stay to maximum rental period. And if we make that as an amendment, then I could offer a subsequent amendment for how to revise the preceding sentence so that it, you know, references the next, you know, the maximum rental period rather than the, the language that's currently there. Okay. Do you want to? I'll make. I'll, do you want, you want me to do both? Well, if you want, whichever. Okay. It looks like you want me right two steps ahead of me. Um, yeah. So I would I would propose that um, that we make the, so the the change the heading of the of of subsection three for, to read maximum rental period and then in the in in that. The, the basically the language that Maureen has just put in there that the advertising reference the relevant maximum rental period for the short term rental type. I don't think it's a sorry. Go ahead, Gretchen. I, I don't, um, Jeremy, I'm not sure. I don't think it's a maximum rental period. To me, that would be like, you can only rent it for four days or you can only rent it for seven days. It's more like maximum turnover or um, Nicole had had a suggestion. Availability, I think I said. Rental intensity, yeah, I like that. I uh, will take that as a friendly amendment. Is that, is that a, change that to the right before rental intensity. Okay, so Jeremy has made a motion. Is there a second on Jeremy's motion regarding rental intensity language here? I'll second it. Seconded by Council Boucher. Is there further discussion on this? So we can come up with the what that language is and provide that to short-term rental operators without having that be part of this here. Okay. Uh, any questions, discussion on this change? Seeing none, um, can we vote this amendment, please, Deb? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The amendment carries. Okay. Um, there was also on our list um, number five there. What do, what, you know, go ahead.
so Laurie, can, I was not understanding the rationale that you were providing earlier for why this is in here and none of the other categories. Because the other categories have a cap, for example, primary residence unhosted says you cannot rent for more than 42 days. Uh, short term rental, you have 182 days. The short term adjacent is 105. The short term, the rental hosted has no cap on the number of days. So that's why it still had that statement about. Um, you see right here where it says no limit on the total number of days. Right, but so again, we're getting into the difference between operating and and um, and uh, intensity. Well, no, 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 but um, um, you know the 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 operator versus the guest or the tenant, and so I I, I understand what you're saying, but. But each of these other categories also, the tenants there must also comply with the rental intensity requirement. Correct. It just seems odd but, to me that but, we're calling it out here. Well, the reason you're, because what this says is, I, it says no limit on the total number of days. And I'm concerned with the term no limit is going to be interpreted to mean there's no limit on rental intensity either. This is what we've experienced over the years. So I think you still need, now that you've changed this, now that you've got this rental intensity um, new title, you probably still need to reference it. Yeah, I think Maureen, I think what Jamie is saying though is that the subject of the sentence is wrong. Instead of, instead of the subject being each short-term rental tenant, the subject should be you know, um, the, the, the host. Yeah. Um, well, I can change it to say the line in these other ones, it says the property may be used as a short-term rental for no more. And I can say the property shall be used as a, no, a short-term rental in compliance with the rental intensity requirement. Does that address your point, Jamie? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I think the language throughout should take the obligation off of the tenant because they, they have zero to do with the uh, compliance with or um, adherence to the ordinance. It is, all of this is about the operator and the, and the property owner. Does anybody else have anything on this? Do we need to vote this as an amendment? I'll move it as an amendment for the purpose of voting if that's useful. Okay, thank you. I'll second. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay. We'll vote on this one. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. This amendment carries. Okay. Um, what was left on the list at the end? This was picked up by Councilor Noonan.
what's the clarification? Can you restate it? Well, it's just, it's, it's, I've got a, an incorrect reference. Short term rental may be operated on a property in a non primary residence when the short term rental owner's primary residence is located on the same lot as the short term rental, not oh. as the primary residence. Are we just accepting that as a correction? That's, we're not. I'm hoping you'll accept it as a correction. <laughs> I don't think we need to vote on that. That's just something that was wrong. Okay. So we've done, we've done all of these then. So the only thing remaining is to reflecting these changes that have been made to go through this one more time to make sure that everything is reconciled. Is that correct? I think so. Is there, is there anybody else that has anything that they want to offer up now that we can go through the same process on? Now would be a great time to do it. I did want to bring up the fee schedule with the $500 fee. And knowing that hosted currently was exempt from ordinances going from zero dollars to five hundred dollars and the amount of complaints against hosted were very low should the fee be two hundred and fifty dollars a year for hosted and five hundred dollars a year for unhosted so my opinion on the fee is that it's um, not something that's intended to be punitive or in response to um, property types that may or may not have generated complaints. First and foremost, the fee at a minimum needs to cover our costs for the monitoring um, analytics tool that we've acquired. So whether you're a hosted rental or an unhosted rental, you're still being monitored in the same way using that platform and that analytics tool. And so I don't feel that um, any one property type should pay a lesser fee for effectively the requirement to subsidize that same service for, for everybody else. Um, so I, I know that there have been some comments that have been offered up that the proposed fee is too high. I will so, add that was before we made the change to two for seven days, which changes the revenue they generate. So I'm not as wanting or needing to change that. So if, if there's discussion to be had about whether or not the $500 fee is too high, I think that's a separate issue than whether or not that everybody that's operating within this ecosystem should be paying the same and, and equitable amount. And, and in my opinion, everybody that's operating within this system should be paying the same amount. Are there other items that folks want to bring forward for discussion as possible amendments right now? I just want to, um, I'm not bringing it forward as an amendment, but I wanted to just um, mention it really quick because um, Jim Kearney has suggested it and other people have talked about the 14 night subcategory. And it's my recollection that um, we didn't set that up because of violations. We wanted to make sure that um, everybody's permitted and everybody is under the same umbrella. But I wanted to be clear about that. Um, is that your recollection, Jamie? Um, it was 
it's my recollection from that standpoint and yes the more the more carve outs that we create the more likelihood there is of people trying to circumvent the rules and bend those you know to their benefit so if so with every layer of complexity adds a further layer of difficulty in administrating all of this and and enforcing it Um, I did want to circle back to a couple of the points that were brought up in the public comment period. Um, the first of which being, I, I can't remember who offered the comment, um, but there was a question about um, bookings from last year that were carried forward to this year and whether or not contracts would be honored. Um, I, I think we've talked at length about this in previous meetings and workshops. Um, I don't know if we need to memorialize it further tonight. Um, I'll offer my personal opinion and welcome the opinions of others that um, any bookings that were made knowing that rules were, you know, highly likely to change, um, you know, were done so at both the operator and the, um, the guest risk. And um, I'm, I, I have zero interest in grandfathering anything um, related to the new changes uh, that are being proposed. I welcome any of those thoughts on that. I agree with that position, Jamie, because we've been talking about this for a, a really long time. And, uh, and even if uh, the pandemic and COVID caused certain things to happen, we still knew this was going to happen. So uh, I don't want to grandfather anything. I agree. Um, I feel like we've been talking about this for a very long time. We even put a moratorium into effect um, last year. So I think that once this changes July 1st, it's, it changes July 1st. May I jump in, Jane? Sure. Gretchen, yep. I'll just add that that also gets very, very messy. We would have to figure out how people could prove to us when they had their, um, you know, when those bookings are made. So I, I just, I could foresee that um, being near, nearly impossible. So I, I, I have a lot of compassion for, you know, if someone had a booking that got canceled because of COVID or something, but I just, I don't know how we'd go through that process. And I, that's, so I agree with you. Okay, another question that was brought up, um, I think it was Scott Dobos that um, brought up the question of um, penalties and uh, maximum fines. I, I, I wanted to turn to Matt um, because I, my, my recollection during our working processes on this was, you know, the penalties are clearly laid out here in the draft language. Um, if somebody is found to be operating without a permit, they're subject to those penalties and that continued violation uh, and, and um, issuance of those penalties uh, would, uh, would eventually lead to some sort of legal action on the part of the town uh, with that party. Is that do I have that right, Matt? Yes, you are, Mr. Chairman. Similar to any other violation of the ordinance, uh, the the code officer would take you know take action and uh, you know issue such thing as a as like a stop work order for construction or uh, basically give them a cease and desist and explain to them uh, you know we get the town's attorney involved and then we would take legal action and then there are penalties that can be instituted there as well by the court system in the state of Maine. Uh, it's not uh, similar to the, you can pay for forgiveness and, and just weigh your chances against the cost annually for being penalized. Uh, eventually that will work its way through the court system and then the courts will, will put enforcements in there and that could be uh, much more substantial than any fines that are levied by the town. 
So the broadband that was laid out by Mr. Dobos is not in effect what would ha happen in in reality if somebody no. wanted to no. go that route. No, that wouldn't that wouldn't ultimately be the the path that would be taken. It's similar to any other violation of the of the of the ordinance. Okay. Um, I think that that was all the questions that were brought up in the pub. Did anybody else note anything that hasn't been answered through the rest of the course of our discussion? Okay. Um, anything else to be brought up now as a possible amendment to be added here? I don't know if this is an amendment for the ordinance, but one thing I'd like to see when there that's just asking for updates or what, but I'd love to see a one year report back or end of year report to see how many complaints there have been, what categories those are broken down by, um, so we can determine the effectiveness of the ordinance changes in some form. So I don't know whether that needs to be language in here or it's just more of a management report line item but I would like to make sure that these are actually impacted because if they're not, then we have more changes to make. I would agree with that. I don't think it's something that needs to be included in the ordinance. Um, I'd say similar to the other programs, the senior tax program and things like that, it's just become operating procedure um, with staff. So. Mr. Chairman, I've taken down the suggestion and what we'll do is uh, I'll, I can work with Ben and Maureen and then look to have that as an annual report at the, uh, you know, towards the, you know, the, the start of the year or at the end of end of December uh, to report out to council uh, what the results are from the from the first season. So we can we can definitely summarize that. I suspect it'll be used when uh, as the council will be obligated to should this um, ordinance go into effect that any um appeals of uh decision of the code enforcement officer will be referred to the council um to review so i imagine that that would be something that the council would need to conduct those reviews is there other Anything else on this before we vote, I presume, to table this so that the reflected changes can be brought forward for a final vote at our April meeting? Going once. Okay, is there a motion to table these amend, this amended, table the amended motion, the amended original motion to our April, what date is our April meeting? 12th, I believe, Mr. Chairman. 12th. Yes. I have the 12th. Yeah. Okay. Yep, April 12th. Okay. Table the amended motion to the April 12th meeting for a vote. So moved. So moved. Second. Councilor Devereaux, is there any discussion? Um, I just want to thank the public for their comments tonight. And as I've done all along, thank them for their input and com comments along the way. I, I also, I want to apologize that we were not able to vote on this tonight. Um, I think, um, I think the, I think we, sh we should have been in a better position to do that. And I'll, I'll take responsibility for that. Um, so my apologies to the public that there's not a final vote on this tonight. Um, I think the position of the council 
is hopefully clear to all of you that have been listening and watching um, and um, that you're clear on, on where things are headed. Um, we've got some I dotting and T crossing to do to just make sure that all of the language is reconciled and reflects um, consistency um, through all these changes that have just been moved as motions, uh, as amendments to the motion rather. Um, and I fully expect that at our April meeting, we will uh, finalize this. And with again, the effective date being July 1. So no impact to the implementation, but um, I, I personally would like to offer apologies to the public for, for not having been able to complete this tonight. So um, I think it's important and good work that we did to, to make sure that um, everything's buttoned up. Um, but um, I, I regret that that's how this went. So uh, in any case, uh, can we call the vote on tabling, please? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next up is uh, item 10 on the agenda, number 43-2021, uh, which we also tabled from the February 8th meeting. Um, so is there a motion to take this item off the table? It's the recommended revision to the comp plan recommendation number 86. So moved. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, roll call to take this off the table, please. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Is there anybody from the public that wants to comment on this? It's obviously directly related to the previous item, but is there anyone specifically that would like to comment on this? Now it's your opportunity. For the record, I'd note we have 38 people in attendance. I don't see any hands having gone up. So uh, without any public comment, is there a motion um, to move forward uh, with this having had a public hearing um, uh, at our February 8th meeting and having been um, reviewed by the planning board previously? Is there a motion to adopt the new recommendation number 86? So moved. Moved by Council Boucher. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, we'll call the roll, please. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Uh, is there next item is number 11, uh, number 52-2021, again, tabled from our February 8th meeting uh, on our goals. Is there a motion to take this item off the table? I'll move to take it off the table. Yeah. Moved by I'll Councilor second Jenny. Seconded second by Councilor Noonan. Is there any discussion? Vote to... Take this off the table, if you could, Deb. Councilor Boucher? Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, so uh, included in the agenda tonight is the updated um, draft of the goals. Thank you again to um, Nicole for all your hard work on putting these together. And thank you everybody for our work at our last workshop to um, uh, put the polishing, uh, finishing touches on this. Um, does anybody have any thing that they want to bring up or discuss or add before we look for a motion to approve the goals? 
Did we do public yeah. comment? Yeah, thank you very much, Nicole. Is there anybody from the public that um, would like to talk about this item? No hands raised. So uh, without public comment, uh, is there a motion to approve the 2021 town council goals? I'll move to approve. Thank you, Councilor Boucher. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? <laughs> move to the vote. Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, 12th on the agenda. We're to hold a public hearing on the ordinance parking amendments for Kettle Cove at Crescent Beach and Seaview Avenue, Glen Avenue. So of the uh, 34 folks we've got remaining in attendance, if you'd like to offer public comment as part of the public hearing, now's your opportunity. Um, we have uh, two sets of uh, recommended revisions to the uh, uh, traffic ordinance uh, for parking amendments um, that are included in the packet. If you could identify yourself uh, by name and address and please limit your comments to three minutes. Um, we will be happy to hear what you have to say. Um, first up in the queue is Tom Makoka. So when um, Matt opens your mic, Tom, just a second, go ahead. Uh, thank you. This is Tom Makoka. I'm at uh, Four Mountain View Road. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I'm representing some work that was done in the neighborhood to address some concerns at Cliff House Beach area resulting in the Seaview and Glen Ave amendment recommended uh, by the ordinance committee and then reviewed at a 2-1 council workshop as well. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, Cliff House Beach is a town-owned property at the end of Seaview Ave. Uh, it's a small pocket beach that's uh, rock at high tide and can be sandy at mid tide to low tide. Um, after years of, of rising use of Cliff House Beach, especially after some newspaper articles and social media hits, um, this summer reached a tipping point with very heavy use uh, and traffic resulting in safety and, and neighborhood character concerns uh, with an overuse of Cliff House Beach. Uh, COVID definitely drove it up, but this is a trend that we've been seeing for years and we expect it to continue. Um, to address this, we conducted a survey in partnership with first the Conservation Committee and then uh, the Ordinance Committee. And we've had several discussions uh, about the results. Um, quickly, uh, this survey went out to 496 homes, 133 people responded, um, including 37 surrounding streets, uh, and about 70 pages of comments, uh, verbatim comments were recorded. So we got a lot of feedback. Uh, the key takeaways that we came away with were 82% um, of the respondents uh, agreed that the increase in people and traffic was really changing the neighborhood character. And 76% agreed that they were avoiding the beach uh, due to this. So it really was losing the neighborhood character that, uh, that the beach had, um, had been enjoyed as for a long time there. Uh, when asked about solutions, 82% uh, agreed that uh, resident only parking restrictions from May to October might help. So we support the recommended changes uh, to parking on Seaview and Glen Ave and hope it addresses the safety and small park overuse concerns that, that we've raised. Of course, if these changes don't have the intended effect or have other unintended effects, then we'll return and address those uh, issues at another time. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, you're on, you're on mute. I beg your pardon, sorry about that. Um, Don is up next in the queue. Uh, if you could just give us your name and address, Don, before you comment, go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, this is Don. Um, I'm, a, uh, I just, I'm, I'm talking about the Crescent Beach uh, rules that Matt was really generous to send out to us. Um, I'm a non-commercial -com lobster person 
um, studied under Tom Schofield, which is like, a, he's such a cool character for a town. Um, but um, uh, I'm just not quite sure what the rules are for me leaving my car on the beach with, while I'm out with my dinghy. Um, Cause it, it seemed very clear about who can go on the beach and who can't go on the beach. But um, I obviously, when I go out my dinghy, I just want to leave the car there parked on the beach and, and what the rules are for that. Um, sure. Th can we just get your last name and address too, please? Oh, sure. Uh, Kennel, K E N N E L, uh, 142, two lights for Odin. Super, thanks. Um, I, I think it, we've brought it before uh, about. Did, so, did you say you're a non commercial lobsterman? Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, that's my challenge because uh, I have to launch my boat in the lobster dude's uh, place, but that's uh, that's state property. That's not the topic for tonight. Um, but. Okay. Uh, but uh, during during lobster season, I uh, park on the beach, take my dinghy out, and then come back, and it, it might be there for an hour, two hours. Okay, because I know we've talked at length about commercial fishermen. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm a five trap lobster person for uh, since 2005, so I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and I'm not the only one. There are other folks there. Uh, Jim Hubner, for instance, on the planning board, he used to do this, and now he's uh, a commercial fisherman. But okay, um, we'll make sure that we discuss and, and certainly address that if it's a gap that needs to be closed uh, in some way. So because um, uh, clearly um, in the summer, there's no way I can get my car up on in, in the Kelco parking lot <laughs> with the trailer in the back. And then bring it back down to the beach afterwards. Yeah. Uh, that's just not going to work. Okay, uh, hey, Jeremy, did you? Sure, yeah. go ahead. Um, uh, thanks for bringing this up, Don. Uh, a big clarifying question for you just is: um, when you're launching your dinghy, are you doing that with a trailer, or are you? Do you have a dinghy that you're you're keeping down there somewhere else that that um, you know? So it's just a car on the beach. I, I, uh, there, there's no uh, place to park a dinghy right now. So I have to bring it on a trailer. So it's, uh, uh, I bring my Mercedes down there with my trailer in the back and I just leave it parked, go uh, go out lobstering and then come back and then leave. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Uh, next up is Jay Pearson. Name and address before your comments, if you don't mind, please. Uh, yes, uh, John Pearson, 24 Elmwood Road. And I'm here to speak tonight about the Seaview Glen Ave Amendment. Uh, first, I want to thank the, uh, the uh, Ordinance Committee and the Council as a whole for, for taking this up. And uh, second, I would ask that you please uh, pass the recommendation. Uh, my wife and I purchased our home in 1998 and uh, where she had grown up in town on Cottage Farms Road in the 70s and 80s. She was very familiar with the beach and had spent a lot of time down there as a kid herself. So we're very familiar with the beach. Uh, we started utilizing it immediately and are so thankful that we have it. Uh, and up until say five years ago, you could go down there anytime and there was always a place to uh, put a, a towel and a couple chairs uh, and enjoy the afternoon. It was very rare to go there. And uh, although you may not have known those folks uh, intimately, they were familiar faces. You knew they were people from the neighborhood. Uh, but the, uh, the, the dominant thing that's taken over our lives, it's both a, a curse and a wonder. The internet is, has really changed the character of the beach. It's not an exaggeration uh, because I speak for myself and my wife that uh, weekends in the summer, we, we wouldn't go down there. Uh, the last time uh, we attempted to was early July last summer and we walked down and we were coming down Mountain View uh, Road and as we were crossing Shore Road, you could, you could see cars were parked on Shore Road. And uh, as you made your way down um, sea view it, cars were parked on both sides of the road all the way down uh, choking that little uh, single lane road 
to uh, such a narrow point that I was hardly able to get a, a car down there. And when we got to the top of the stairs, we looked down at just just mass of humanity and and just looked at each other and and we just turned around and went home. Uh, and, and that's a bit heartbreaking for us, but that pales in comparison to what the people who live uh, on uh, Seaview and Glen Ave have had to endure. Uh, it, it, it is cars parked up and down both sides of the streets, cars with two wheels on your lawn, uh, people that aren't really connected to the neighborhood and uh, leaving you know, leaving trash is more trash there than, than I had remembered in the past. And um, I think that you folks can provide some relief because the genie's out of the bottle and COVID or not, you're not gonna put the genie back in the bottle. Um, so I would really uh, ask that you to, to, to pass the item and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next in the queue is Tom Myers. Tom, if you wouldn't mind with your address as well, just before your comments, please. Should be good to go, Tom. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just, um, it's been a long night for you, and I appreciate the discussion. Uh, I won't uh, be redundant. I'll say the same thing that Tom McCulloch did. He represented the situation nicely. I, I just want to um, thank you hard work of the conservation committee, the ordinance committee, and the individual counselors who took the time to um, investigate and understand the situation here to be really clear as to what you're voting on tonight. I also appreciate the hard work of Maureen, who uh, shepherded us through the process uh, that we've gone through. Uh, a very healthy give and take process where we looked at this Good ideas and then we had some dumb ideas too. And we were, you know, fortunately blessed to I think you know, it's a good, you know, good result here to meet the objectives of safety and care for the Hey Tom. Yes. Well, I'm having a really hard time hearing you. I don't know if others are as well. I, I don't know if okay. you can adjust okay. is it just uh, a, some, uh, it's still still a lot of competing noise there. Okay, well, guess what? I'll just say uh, thanks, and uh, you guys did a great job. And uh, I'll sign off. I don't know what I seem to. Okay, have to I'm, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that we got a bad connection there, but no worries. Okay. Um, Doug McFad is next, and that'll open your microphone in just a second. Should be good to go. Go ahead, Doug. Doug. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Doug McFad, 25 Broad Cove Road. Uh, first, I want to just thank the council and uh, for all the work that you're doing for bringing uh, all of these subjects uh, to our attention and to helping to solve the problems that we've got. Um, I'm here directly to speak to the Crescent Beach um, parking ordinance that you're uh, putting through. And uh, to start by saying that um, we have a mooring there at Crescent Beach and um, we were able to access it last year. Uh, sometimes we would use our uh, dinghy that was on a trailer, but often we used our um, paddle boards that were on top of our car. And so I'm concerned that that is going to be a limiting uh, the factor that the new ordinance is going to um, not allow us to launch our dinghies from our car. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak to that and to those that have moorings there. Okay, Doug, uh, we will address that. Um, is that something that you will be discussing tonight before there will be a vote on this? Yep. Yeah, I think like the non-commercial fisher, um, uh, fisherman access, it, it's something we'll need to reconcile here, so. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'll be yep. that. Okay, thanks. Is there anybody else that wants to uh, speak as part of the public hearing on this item. Seeing nobody, last chance. Okay, seeing nobody, 
um, we will move to consideration of the item, which is number 53-2021. Uh, the uh, recommended parking amendments uh, impacting the traffic ordinance included uh, in the agenda this evening for both uh, Kettle Cove at Crescent Beach, as well as Seaview Avenue, Glen Avenue. Is there a motion? Oh, well, before we get to motions, why don't we tackle these two things with Kettle Cove first, uh, just so that we're um, uh, getting out of the way. So um, let's talk about the commercial fishing um, access, non-commercial fishing access first. Um, anybody want to weigh in on that with any solution? Jeremy? So um, thank you, Jamie. Um, I, I would... Um, uh, based on my reading and and what we heard from Don earlier, I think he's covered. Um, so so the the way that it reads now, you can park on the beach if you are a park a commercially commercially licensed fisherman or a motor vehicle parked by someone with a boat launch pass for the reasonably necessary purpose of launching and unlaunching a trailered watercraft. So if he's launching his dinghy from a trailer, um, he's fine whether he's a commercial fisherman or has a recreational license. I think the point that Mr. McFad brought up around um, accessing moorings from a, from a paddle board as opposed to a dinghy is a different one. Um, my personal feelings on this are if you need the beach to launch a dinghy, you should use the beach to launch from a dinghy. If you're not launching with a dinghy with a, that's trailered, there are other places nearby that you can launch from, including Kettle Cove and including the, the beach at the state park. Um, if, if your preference is to access your mooring with something other than a trailer watercraft. That's, that's my, that was the discussion that we had in the ordinance committee and that's my personal opinion. Um, Gretchen, I'll come to you in just a second. So yep. it, I, I just wanna make sure that we, uh, on the first half of that, uh, it, it does the language as it stands accommodate for uh, the the fishing access that we just discussed? That's how I I read it the same way Jeremy does. Okay. But I interpret it the same way. But if we think it needs to be clarified in some way, um, maybe there's a word missing. But I think it says what we intend because it's the boat launch path becomes important also. Okay. So leave as is on that. Okay. Um, other comments, reaction to the mooring access? Gretchen, sorry, you had, I had to come to you next. <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. Um, so I, I understand where Jeremy's coming from. I'll just point out that for at least three months a year, it, it's almost, it can be almost impossible to park at Kettle Cove. And those moorings are on that end of the beach. So if you um, have a mooring there on that other end of Crescent to park, first of all, you have to buy a state park pass to park at Crescent Beach. So you've paid for a mooring and now you're paying for a state park pass. And then you're walking your paddleboard and your family and your cooler and everything that you're gonna take out in your boat all the way down to the other end of Crescent Beach. I, I think that's an unreasonable burden on people who have gotten a mooring. Um, and I'd, I'd also just like to know um, if anyone has this background, have we tried allowing people even just recreationally paddleboard and kayak from Crescent? I mean, is, it, is, is that an issue? My understanding is that the issue was people beach going. And I have seen, I've had that pass for, for a couple of years and I know we're trying to codify sort of what the traditional use has been. And I have certainly seen that as a traditional use, paddleboarding and kayaking from Crescent. So I, I just, I don't know if that has been identified as being a problem. I'm not sure why we're eliminating it or not allowing it, I guess is my, so it's, Caitlin? it looks like Caitlin has a, Caitlin, you're, you're muted, Caitlin. 
Sorry, I went so unmuted for so long. Um, how many moorings are on that end of Crescent? And could we just somehow tie, you know, like a similar boat launch pass to your mooring? So it's it's not everybody with a paddleboard or, you know, a kayak. Oh. It's just those that are accessing their mooring. Because you make a good point, Gretchen, about the hike. But normal people won't be making a hike to a mooring, just the mooring holders. That's a good suggestion. So that would be like a separate parking sticker or sort of what you're talking about? Something. Yeah. There, there are 13 at the Crescent Beach end and there are one, two, three, six. And there are 12 on the Kettle Cove uh, under the under that mooring permit, yeah. so roughly 25 between the two. One, of, if 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 I may, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Councilor Newman's question, one of the uh, challenges we do have is enforcement, and mm. un unable to tell if someone has launched a paddleboard or something else uh, that uh, that isn't as unfortunately obvious uh, to, mm. to know if they've launched from there. Trailer makes it easy to know that someone's launched a launched a boat, and uh, from from the visual visual side of it, uh, last year we had people who would say they were launching, and uh, they yeah they were launching chairs, but last year was, <laughs> I think, an anomaly as well in many ways too. Okay. Got it. Go ahead, Caitlin. Well, I, and again, I should know the stuff, but how many available moorings are there? So if you get a parking on the beach pass that just comes with your mooring, are we going to have a flood of everybody wanting to get a mooring just so that they can park on the beach? I'm afraid I don't know the, the number of available moorings. I don't think it's many over there. No. I can't say for sure, but my understanding has been that they're hard to come by. Right, um, Let's, and I also don't know what the cost might be prohibitive as well. I don't know what they cost, but oh, it's not okay. <laughs> That's probably why they're in demand. <laughs> they're not. Penny, go ahead. I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, I, you're you're square lit up. I thought that's why I, I thought you were starting to talk. Oh uh, no. No, 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 no. I was just thinking. I, I think our objective here was to get to limiting parking on, on the beach. That's our objective. And I have to tell you, I agree with Jeremy. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's the way it is. That, um, and Caitlin's point about the moorings, that sounded like a good solution until you start going, okay, but can it be abused in some way. So um, it, it always saddens me that we have to create rules and laws because people make choices. Um, and so I'm, I'm with Jeremy. I, I think if you've got a paddleboard, you've got to carry your paddleboard. You don't park on the beach. Jeremy? I, I would just note to Gretchen's point too that you also should have a state park pass or be paying the Iron Ranger if you're parking in Kettle Cove um, per the state law. Okay. Um, we don't yet have a motion. Uh, does anybody want to make a motion here? I. I move that we accept the ordinance changes to Kettle Cove and CU Avenue as uh, put forward by the uh, ordinance committee. Moved by Councilor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there any discussion? Caitlin? So my draft that I'm looking at for section 1339, 
it crosses it crosses out for commercial fishing activities. I, I thought that was supposed to go back in because it basically makes it so that commercial fishing activities are no longer exempt for the rest of the year. What's the thought on that? Recollection too. Yeah. They show up crossed out versus underlined. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, uh, as when when you uh, read that section there, uh, uh, I was going. I, I emailed with Nate Perry earlier today about this because he had a similar question. When you read that sentence, there's a there's a comma that's not really easy to see there. So it's it, I think it's more or less identifying watercraft without any specific regulation. So it's the purpose of launching a watercraft comma for. The, for the commercial harvesting of rockweed or seaweed comma or for public safety or authorized beach maintenance purposes so it shouldn't uh, limit the limit commercial launch throughout the rest of the year but i think it just uh, it takes uh takes that uh, almost clarifies that restriction that was there before uh, away i i can you explain that again because yeah. I, I i don't get it well um at first, it's, it seemed like it had the, the way that that access restriction was worded was uh, the purposes of launching a watercraft for commercial fishing activities. And uh, so it, would, it almost made it look as if it was limited only to launching a watercraft for commercial fishing activities. Whereas in this case, it's for launching a watercraft without the qualifier limiting it to only to commercial activities. So it's for launching a watercraft, comma, for the commercial harvesting of rockweed or seaweed, comma, or for public safety or authorized beach maintenance purposes. So it's now that's a listing of three different reasons why a person should be launching a car there uh, and not solely restricting it to just commercial launches. But we need to add in the commercial launches back in because you're going to launch, commercial fishermen are going to launch for something other than harvesting rockweed or seaweed. Right. That's the part right. we're missing. Like, right. Like, Perry, for example, doesn't want to go cut seaweed. He wants to go check on his oysters and his, his aquaculture. Yeah, I think there's a comma that's marked it, for it, deletion that should be staying in. I think what Matt's saying, though, is it's actually two different things. It's for the purpose of, one, launching a watercraft. Two, commercial harvesting of rockweed or seaweed, which may or may not involve a watercraft. Or three, public safety and authorized beach maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the comma is removed, so it's only showing two oh, yeah. right now. There, there, there is an edit that's needed to clarify that, but I, I think the 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 commercial harvesting and uh, and of rockweed or seaweed is not intended to modify a watercraft in this clause. If I'm re if if I'm understanding Matt correctly, I I'm with Caitlin. You do more than harvest rockweed. You are you're, it's you're one, a commercial two, fisherman. One, two, or, or three, three, not and. You're right. saying you know, watercraft, whether you're commercial or not mm -hmm. commercial. You can right. go do what you want. So it's, it's just, right. I need to, I, can I see that somewhere where it's cleaned up and the commas are, so no person shall operate a motor vehicle on Crescent Beach except for the express purpose of launching a watercraft. Mm -hmm. For the commercial harvesting of rockweed or seaweed, or for the public safety of authorized beach maintenance purposes. So those three things. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And that and that would be year round. That wouldn't because it's a separate section. It's not uh, the part above, which is the uh, limited parking uh, section of it. Because if we had to, you know, if we had to go down there to uh, for public safety, we wouldn't just want to be, we wouldn't want to limit ourselves to uh, driving on the beach. Oh, sorry, you did that in in October, and uh, uh, we we can't launch there at that point in time. So that's they're two separate separate areas. Can we clean up the language, like Caitlin said? It's just so we can see it.
Maureen, Can you would bring you it up uh, on the, would, bring it up on the screen? Yeah, Maureen, would you be able to to fire that up on the? So, is the difference between the sections then like this is no person shall operate a motor vehicle on Crescent Beach? It has nothing to do with parking. And then section three thirteen two four is specifically about parking. So, are they not allowed to park the rest of the year? I would like to refer to my planner for that <laughs> on that on that side as far as the the linkages uh, take place. I think she can answer to that more clearly than I can. Sorry about that. Uh, so your current ordinance has this language of May through November and. It says basically, if you're a commercial fisherman, you you have full access to the beach for parking, um, unloading your watercraft, and then anyone else needs that boat launch pass. And then the activities uh, again. I mean, I know that the the um, the correction, the add and delete. Yes, this this comma here happens to be deleted, but this one is back, so it is. It's launching a watercraft, comma, for the commercial harvesting of walkweed or seaweed, comma, or for public safety or authorized beach maintenance purposes. So there's nothing that deletes commercial activities. Right. My question now is section 1324 is talking about parking, which commercial fishermen can park on the beach from May through November, right? But then section 1339 is only talking about operating a vehicle on the beach. Well, this isn't the whole ordinance. This is only selected sections of the ordinance. So I wouldn't want to speculate on answering your question unless I had the whole document in front of me. But it does under the prior section though, uh, 13.24, uh, does carve out an exception for commercially licensed fishermen that they're not limited by that time period during the year. Right, that made right. Them remember. So, I mean, if you're asking about the rest of the time period, it could be in a different part of the ordinance. And I just, I don't have that in front of me. Um, but everything in this draft is, I think, pro-commercial fishery. Right. concerns addressed? I think. Okay. I think so. Other, other discussion? We, we had a motion and a second, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Other discussion? Go ahead, Councilor Nina. Thank you. Um, I'm just coming back <laughs> to the um, to the mooring, I just i i would i would be loath to vote against our friends at Cliff House Beach because I think that they need, um, they definitely need some some help with their situation. But I just i i can't in good conscience. I don't think vote for this if we are not allowing people full access to a mooring that they've signed up and I I'm assuming paid for. Um, I just I don't know if it sounded like there wasn't a lot of other uh, interest in doing some kind of additional little parking sticker or something, but I would still advocate for that. Okay. Uh, other discussion, other opinions on that? or on other components of the ordinance recommendations, the amendments. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to move away from Kettle Cove Crescent Beach and um, offer my opinion that um, I oppose the inclusion of the resident only sticker for um, a resident only parking for Seaview Cliff House Beach. Um, and um, I have tremendous um, uh, appreciation for all the work that was done to bring forward um, you know, the input from, from the neighborhood over there and um, the collaborative uh, approach that was taken to try and come up with uh, an appropriate solution. I think all the rest of it, um, I'm wholeheartedly in favor of. And I think going back to our workshop on this, um, I think I was one of the first people to support extending the, the one side of the street parking further than had been pr proposed. Um, I think that resident only parking um, is, uh, is opening up a significant uh, and creating a significant precedent that um, I don't think is either warranted here or one that we want to be dealing with um, with the avalanche of requests that are going to follow um, uh, for similar designation for other parts of town. I had asked the manager to provide us with uh, information confirming whether or not there were any other places in town besides the Garden Circle, Maiden Cove, lane area um, that had any resident only restriction and there aren't. Um, there have been numerous times where other places in town have brought forward that request and, and the council has not gone in that direction. Um, Surf Road being a recent example of that where um, one side of the street parking restriction was favored in, in instead of uh, going with resident only. The resident only um, on the garden circle, garden, um, whatever that is down there, um, emanates from a very specific problem with one house, one property there that didn't have a driveway. And so the resident had to park on the street. It's a very, very tight area. I believe based on the nature of the resident's profession, um, frequent and emergency access in and out was needed. And that's how that came about. Um, and um, I, I think it's such a specific and narrow example that, and none of us was, I believe on the council when it came up. Um, so, but I, I just don't think that um, it's a comparable example to this situation. Um, I have spoken with the chief of police about this and he has significant concerns about being able to uh, monitor and enforce this. and. For all of those reasons, I, I don't think that it's necessary. I think that the, there will be significant relief provided by the one side of the street parking, and I fully support that, but I don't support the resident um, only designation. Are there other comments, other discussion? I, I have something, I understand your position, Jamie, and I respect it immensely. I, and I'm gonna go back to the fact that um, um, we, we have to constantly balance. And I, I'm not saying that there's uh, passing this um, uh, resident only parking isn't going to open up other uh, places where people are going to uh, request that. But uh, times are different, just like they are as we talk about short-term rentals. And, and, um, and I really think that I, can't, I wanna strike a balance between um, Cape Elizabeth being the uh, recreational town of Greater Portland or Cape this being a town for its residents. And so I, I constantly weigh that and go, okay, it's about the people who live here. And we need to make sure that uh, they are able to continue to enjoy the assets of the town uh, that they moved here to enjoy. 
Um, and I'm not saying I want a gated community. I'm just saying that there are mechanisms we can put in place that uh, will uh, allow us to balance the changing world that we live in every day as a result of technology, balance that with uh, what we want the essence of our town to be. And so that's why I really uh, support the position of the resident only parking. I, um, I have to agree with Penny. I think that um, they're talking about five months a year. It is so busy down there. Um, and quite frankly, I think it's only going to get busier the way the, um, the internet is and these come find this hidden gem. It needs to be a place where residents can park and people from Cape can go and enjoy the beach too. So I, I support this um, stickers for parking. Um, Jamie, I'll, I'll just add a little bit on too, because I, I, I started off very much in the same position you're, you're advocating. I, I, I do think there's, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't come to recommending this lightly. Um, and I think what um, a couple of things that, that really made me feel like this would be a useful solution here. Um, one was description from neighbors about how people are accessing the beach. Um, and in particular, uh, did, you know, looking at how people will go down to Willard Beach, see the parking lot area is full, pull up their Google Maps, and then just search for nearby beaches. This comes up. Um, and then they come over, cruise over here. So, so sort of, in, in a sense, just sort of stemming some of that cruising behavior um, that's, that has become associated with this beach because of the way that wayfinding now works. Um, the, I think the other thing, and I, I, I do think we have a bigger issue, as Penny alluded to, with overflow impacts of recreational amenities in various parts of town. Um, and I think that's something, you know, I, I'd certainly like the Conservation Commission Committee to pay a little bit more attention to. I think of places like Fenway, um, very, you know, um, various other places where the, the parking is, is not adequate for peak demand for those recreational assets. Um, and what makes me feel comfortable with recommending resident only parking as a solution here, as opposed to say someplace like Winnick Woods or, or Great Pond is there really is, is no other, or there, I shouldn't say there's no other, there's very few other remedies that are, that are allowed by the geography. We just don't have the room to convert this park, even if we converted all of it to off street parking, it would not provide sufficient parking relief for the level of demand. We have other tools that we could use to alleviate some of that recreational parking demand elsewhere in town that just aren't available to us here in this neighborhood. So that, that's, that's my logic for coming around to this position. I'll just say I appreciate the explanations. I still disagree. I think, and I think that the council will be inviting um, literally a parade of people from other places in town um, looking for the same accommodation. And um, I, th I think it'll be difficult to, uh, without being seen as purely subjective, um, uh, have any justification for why one deserves and the other doesn't, so. Um, other discussion on the question on the floor? How do we want to proceed with questions on uh, thoughts around, uh, is there a solution that we can come up with that, um, will allow us to balance. I recognize, again, it's another enforcement issue uh, because somebody has to check permits. It's, 
cetera. Um, and, um, uh, but do we wanna to try to solve for that at this point? Does anybody have something that they think is workable? That's what I've been trying to think of. Um, Caitlin's was, okay, Gretchen suggested, I believe it was Gretchen, suggested that when you, or it might've been Caitlin, when you get your, um, your mooring, you get a permit. Um, so if we, uh, go down that road, you get a mooring, you get a permit. Um, yeah, we got to check permits. Um, are we say that um, we're accepting that there needs to be a position with the uh, police department that is focused on parking in town? Because that's the only way we can we can monitor it. Monitor it because uh, I don't think we want our, uh, our all our police resources just focused on parking. It needs to be something a position that augments in the police department to get an internship from uh, law enforcement at uh, SMTC or something like that. Everybody's got always looking for a summer internship, um, something along those lines. I know most of my friends, when we're in uh, law enforcement, uh, we would uh, go for the jobs at the various uh, summer towns and do that type of work. So I think there's a solution. But that's kind of where I would head. Gretchen? Um, so I, I don't know in general, Penny, what the answer to that is, but if we were to allow people who have a mooring to get maybe a different beach pass, it's a different color or something that shows that they have a mooring, I don't see that as any additional enforcement, because if someone's going down there already to make sure everybody has a trailer on their car, then they can just check their color of their beach pass or something. So I don't know if you're talking more generally about, you know, is this becoming a bigger problem townwide? I, I don't know the answer to that, but in terms of just allowing mooring holders to park down there, I don't, if we could give them just, like I said, a different color beach pass or something, if someone's down there looking for trailers, they can just look at the beach passes too. I don't see it as any additional enforcement mm -hmm. over what we have drafted here already. So that's my view of it anyway. I was going to say, you could just have them register the vehicle with their mooring so that they don't even need a pass. It can just be looked up that the vehicle is permitted to be there. Because there will only be, what, Matt, say 25 of them? If I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, it may be something as simple as creating an additional decal that says mooring, uh, mooring holder. And sure. having that having that uh, displayed in a way that could be uh, could be obvious, uh, if that would if that would work around. And then uh, I, I don't know if you want to change the language, but we you know as as Councilor Jordan and Noonan also identified, if there's only 25 and really we're talking possibly about three to five of them over the course of a year, uh, uh, I think that's something that. I know Chief Fenton's on uh, the meeting as well tonight. It's something from an enforcement side that I know we can we can find a way to to make that work. And the, the big issue we had last year was just was just rampant abuse where folks would come in and and you know the, it was a slippery slope of saying that they were launching a watercraft with a wink and a nod and uh, and then we had the had the challenge of trying to. Uh, enforce that and it just was overwhelming. And Maureen is uh, reading my mind as far as making a non-substantial uh, change in here that will provide for clarity. So thank you, for, thanks for that Maureen. Does that work, Gretchen? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being open to that. It, it is, as they say, I think, uh, as Councillor Penny Jordan would say, an elegant solution. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, is there a further discussion? Gretchen, you just don't want to say something or you just got your hand up still? Okay. I guess you, Gretchen. Oh. <laughs> All right. If there's no additional discussion, are we ready to vote on this? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? No. Motion carries six yay, one nay. Um. Next up is uh, item number 13 on the agenda, number 54-2021. I've been um, communicating with the manager offline here, and I think we're going to push this to our April meeting. Is that right, Matt? Yes, sir. And yep. my apologies to the folks from the Civil Rights Committee, who um, I know it looks like most of you are still hanging on. Um, we did have a rather full agenda with some items that went a lot longer than I would have liked them to have gone. So. Thank you very much for being prepared to go tonight, but also um, more importantly, thank you for your flexibility in um, being willing to push this to our April meeting. Um, so, um, and also technically with it being 10.07, I'm gonna need uh, quickly a motion from somebody um, to continue with new business uh, beyond our um, 10 o'clock hour. So if somebody could do that, please. So moved. Second. Second by Councilor Jordan, Penny Jordan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, can we roll call that, Deb? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, uh, where are we? We are at uh, number 14, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, next up is item 14 on the agenda, number 55 2021, recommendation from the Conservation Committee regarding uh, naming of unnamed water bodies. This was a goal and recommendation from the comprehensive plan, recommendation number 72. Uh, the Conservation Committee has provided uh, an overview and voted six nothing to recommend the names for the bodies of water that are included in our agenda. Um, do we have anybody from the Conservation Committee on the, on the meeting here? Oh, and Maureen is still with us. Um, is there anybody from the committee itself? I can't tell from the attendees, no. Maureen, did you wanna do anything to introduce us further or than I just did or? That was a brilliant introduction. I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay. Is there um, any questions or a motion from council on the names that were recommended? I have uh, I have some comments which aren't worth getting into tonight. So I would move that we refer this to a future council workshop for discussion. Sounds like a fabulous motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Councilor Devereaux. Any discussion? Seeing none. Can we vote on that, please, Deb? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 15 is uh, number 56-2021, consideration to endorse the extended producer responsibility resolution. Um, last month, 
we had a presentation um, from the Natural Resources Council of Maine, um, providing an overview of the uh, extended producer responsibility initiative that they're championing. Um, we have uh, sustainability and um, matters pertaining to improving recycling in our community as one of our goals, uh, standing goals. Is there anybody from the public that would like to talk about this item? Uh, I see Don, your hand is still up. I don't know if that's raised from before or if you wanted to talk about this item. Go ahead. You might be muted on your end, Don. Or not. Um, is there anybody else that would like to talk about this? Seeing Nobody. Um, is there any counselor that would like to make a motion or um, offer up any discussion points? Yeah, Never I'll, I'll move that we um, accept the resolution, that we vote on the resolution. I'm getting tired. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, is there a second? Second by Council. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, uh, is there? Uh, can we do the roll call step? Councilor Boucher. Yes. Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Yep. Councilor Noonan. Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 16 on the agenda is number 57-2021, receipt of the, uh, the audit results for fiscal 2020. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak about this item? Seeing nobody. Um, we had a workshop meeting uh, jointly with the school board last month, at which point the fiscal 2020 uh, audit results were presented by Runyon Kirsting uh, Willette. Um, it was a very favorable audit result. Uh, council appreciates the work of staff and uh, the auditor for all the time and energy that was put into that, particularly um, given some of the considerations that had to be made um, for COVID and public health reasons. Um, so uh, seeing no public comment, uh, I would like to seek a motion just to acknowledge receipt of the results and the reports that associate with the audit. So moved. Moved by Councillor Deborah. Councillor Boucher. Is there any discussion? None. Councillor Boucher. Yes. Councillor Devereaux. Yes. Councillor Gabrielson. Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councillor Noonan. Yes. Chairman Garvin. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is item 17, number 58-2021, uh, referring of the fiscal 22 budget to the finance committee. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this? Seeing none. Um, Matt, thank you for your work and the work of staff to deliver the electronic version to us last week. Uh, and we are eagerly anticipating the hard copies tomorrow. Is there anything that you wanted to add before we make a motion to refer this? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I will be, uh, I'll be very brief or try to be as best as I can. Uh, I just want to let you know this, we're ex extremely proud of this budget to come out of the, to come out of the box with this. Uh, very grateful to the work of John Quartararo, our finance director, as well as all the department heads for all their hard work on this. We did start the budget process earlier this year than, than, than usual. Uh, we began our capital planning uh, that, uh, you know, much of it was front of mind due to last year's budget and, and the reconsideration that we needed to take to get that forward. So you will see a number of those elements back in this year. Uh, however, uh, we are we are trying to come forward with a very responsible budget to start. Uh, right now, you uh, 
You may, you may recall the last year's municipal, municipal budget experienced a significant revision to adapt to the pandemic influences. Uh, last year's budget decreased the municipal rate by 3.46%. Uh, sorry, last year's budget decreased the municipal rate. This year, we're looking at a 3.46% increase, and that's resulting in, over the two-year term, 0.15% increase uh, on the town tax rate. So uh, we have tried to come forward with a very re responsible budget. Uh, where we have, uh, we are, where there are opportunities for grant funding, we are exploring all of those options, as well as lease purchasing uh, for, for some of the heavier items and uh, other items that have longer lives uh, that also allow the town to experience the, the productivity of the asset while at the same time spreading that cost over multiple years uh, and all that resulting in an impact uh, of a low, low amount in comparison to prior years. That being said, the hour is getting late. I look forward to working with the council and, and coming back next Monday night as we go through start. And now, quick reminder, starting at 6 p.m., Councilor Jordan, I have a note to myself to bring a pizza to your house because that was the deal. So Monday night, dinner's on me. And uh, look forward to going through and all the department heads are looking forward to going through as well. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I know there will be many more as we go forward. Are you bringing beer with the pizza? Or just <laughs> You'll have to go to Cumbies for that, Counselor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I just want to remind everybody that the um, the budget meetings uh, will be at six o'clock instead of the usual seven o'clock for a meeting. So, um, so we can try and avoid being here at twenty after ten. Um, so, any other comment discussion? Uh, if not a motion, please to forward um, the 2022 budget to the Finance Committee. So moved. Moved by Councilor Devereaux, second. Second. Okay. Seconded by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion. Deb? Councilor Boucher? Yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Next is uh, item 18 on our agenda, which is number 59-2029, a consent agreement with two Penguin Properties LLC. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak about this item? Seeing none, um, Matt, can I ask you to give just a brief uh, overview here? I would, I would love to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what you have before you this evening is a consent agreement that has been negotiated between the town's attorney and Dr. Meyerowitz's uh, attorney uh, to try to rectify a situation that has evolved uh, with the STR amendments and uh, where there was a conflict between a proposal, uh, a proposed development that took place at the planning board received uh, approval uh, and, and it entered into, into the, um, the site plan review process uh, without understanding that some of those changes that took place, specifically the last one, which would be converting uh, short-term rentals from being a commercial use to an accessory use. And it has brought this property into a, a cash 22 situation. So uh, to try to to try to rectify it. That's why we're coming forward with this consent agreement this evening, which would basically place the property into a legal non-conforming status uh, that would allow them to do what they received their approvals for, uh, takes the conflict out of the situation. And uh, it's the only example of this in the entirety of town, entirety of the Cape Elizabeth Township that has this as a situation. So it is not opening Pandora's box, but it is trying to correct a situation where we had an applicant who entered into the process, you know, with all with all true virtues going forward, and went through the whole process, and then with this one change that took place at the end, has been put into a precarious situation, uh, not of his making. So that's why we're bringing it forward this evening, with a recommendation by the town's attorney to uh, to to move forward with this consent agreement. Matt, is it premature to vote on this tonight, prior to having actually finalized 
those um, uh, those amendments? Well, uh, <laughs> I will say that we did bring this forward thinking that the STR amendments were going forward. With the items that uh, the area that they're looking at, which is specifically uh, the transfer it from being a, a, a commercial use to an accessory use, uh, has not been an item that has been looked at for change. And uh, it's been, that was one of the recommendations from the planning board that has come forward. So one way or the other, you can you can enter into, into it this evening and it'll become ripe when the amendments uh, go forward. Or uh, uh, so it'd probably be why, I mean, you can do that now in anticipation of it. I know Dr. Meyerowitz would like to uh, begin get, uh, getting his building permit so we can start going forward with this project. And that this is a, this is currently sits as an obstacle for that as well. So uh, if that is in hand, uh, he can go forward with what he needs to do. And it will also provide the code officer the direction that he'll need to know to uh, be able to issue the permit uh, going forward. Okay. Jeremy. Um, so I, thank you for bringing this forward, Matt. Um, I guess one question I have, and maybe this is as much a question for Maureen, um, and forgive me if I'm forgetting details because I'm getting tired, um, but, <laughs> but um, my understanding is that typically when you have grandfathered uses, if the use ceases, then the grandfather the grandfathered use that was out of conformance then has to become a compliant use. So with this as a short-term rental, as a, um, as a grandfathered non-compliant use um, for this property, does the consent agreement sp speak to, you know, what, what happens, you know, define how that, that use becomes, you know, is it like they don't renew their permit for a year and then the grandfather goes away? Like how does how does this how does this grandfathered use come into compliance at some point? One of the conditions of approval with the approval of the project was that it needed to have a short-term rental on the first floor. Right. I guess what I'm asking though is like are we allowing this grandfathered use to run for the duration of the property until they come back for site plan review at some point in the future? Or are we saying that if they lapse in their use of the property as a short-term rental, that the grandfathering would, would, would go away as well? Well, it's, it would still have to have a commercial use on the first floor to be, to be compliant uh, due to town center zoning. Uh, the catch 22 is that with this becoming uh, with, with short-term rental going to become an accessory use versus a commercial use is, is in a sense, you're, you're governing the STR as a commercial use uh, once the ordinance has moved on to call it an accessory use. So uh, if, if there was a change that would take place, then it would have to be, you know, if you wanted to put in a, a television repair shop on the first floor and that meets a commercial use, then that would be fine. They would have, but it would still have to be a commercial use. This would be more or less grandfathering the, the short-term rental as a commercial use. But if, uh, but if, that, if that failed to be, then you, would, then you would be out of compliance with the approval and we'd have to, do, we'd have to pursue that similar with others, uh, the other mechanisms, I, I would say. Deborah? You know, it's so late. I, I would really prefer to table this so that we have time to discuss it and um, where it's not 10, 24 at night, um, I think it would do it justice if we, we did that. Mr. Chairman, I, I see that we have a public comment hand raised too. I don't know if they, I can't recall if we opened that for this item or not. Um, I did and nobody spoke, but go, go ahead, um, we'll do that. Dr. Zeva, you should be active now. Uh, thank you very much for being patient during this entire process. It's uh, certainly been, uh, I would use the word entertaining to listen for the last three and a half hours, but uh, you know, I, I thank you for all of your tireless work on, on all of these topics that I would normally run away screaming from. Um, so the, you know, it, it, what the situation that you have in front of you is basically to avoid a lawsuit 
by my attorney uh, against the town. We have the, the, the point of this agreement is to simply allow my project to continue when uh, in standard fashion, when the, the planning board approves a use for a lot. Um, that lot is grandfathered. There is a typical, I, I believe, Matt, you can correct me on this, but there is a window where changes to the zoning ordinance can occur that could be retroactively applied. In this case, that window has passed. I believe it's approximately 60 days and this approval was way back from October. Um, I do not believe I, uh, this, this agreement keeps me from starting construction on the building but it could uh, conceivably limit me from getting an occupancy permit based on this use. Um, you, know, you are certainly, you have your own uh, ability to debate and merit this. Um, the recommendations for this agreement do come from pretty significant conversations between my attorney and the town's attorney. And uh, the impression was that they would both wish to avoid litigation in this case as it would uh, result in my favor and uh, it would cost uh, both the town significant monies um, as well as myself and having to go through that process. Um, additionally, I do believe the court system is somewhat uh, encumbered with the events of the last year. And I would like to start my building. Um, we started this process just over a year ago. My initial site plan submissions were way back in April or May of 2020. Um, I had a motion to approve back in August and September, and I'm, I'm still waiting on this process. And so, you know, I, I had alluded in a prior conversation with the town council that I had felt that because this project was not a preferred one for various members, whether without going into particular names, that I was being inappropriately delayed. Um, this submission conformed to the planning board. Um, it conformed to the to the ordinances and you know to be held up yet again at the last hour for debate um, at 10 30 at night you know i i understand that everybody's tired um but this this has been uh, delayed for four months at this point and i would i would really appreciate some neighborly um constitution that we could move this forward <laughs> thanks dr Marowitz. um I, I don't, my concern isn't with the, um, isn't with the hour uh, of the of the meeting here. My, my concern is, is more of, um, e even though this wasn't an item that was up for debate, just it, it feels a little weird to me to approve this prior to the specific ordinance amendments take, you know, having been approved that are what's causing it in the first place. But that, that's my only, and I, I completely understand what um, what was just said, and um, it, I, it also sounds like maybe the building can move forward while this is still on hold. It didn't sound, sound like this was actually holding up shovels in the ground. So I, I'm not, I'm not if, it, if, it, if, it, if that's the case, and we can tie this off. The way, the, the way it's all worded is all about the amendments, zoning ordinance amendments dated October 10th. So I don't think it matters if the, the amendments are approved or not, because the way that this document is worded would account for it being approved in April. Say that again? If you read through all of the, the clauses here, it, it says that the zoning ordinance is being recommended for changes dated October 10th, 2020, which is when that first draft was made. So even if we approve this today and we approve short-term rental ordinance in April, this would still stand. I, we don't need to approve one before the other um, because oh, okay. of why I this is worded. I, I was yeah. looking at the October 20th date that references their decision. I didn't see what you were talking about. Okay. I agree okay. with that, Nicole. I, I don't think you need to. So I'm going to motion to approve this. Yeah. Okay. I second it. I second. 
Motion by Councillor Boucher, seconded by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there further discussion? Okay. Uh, can we have the vote, please, Linda? Councillor Boucher? Yes. Councillor Devereaux? No. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Noonan? No. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries, five yay, two nay. Thank you. Uh, next up is item number 19, 60-2021, uh, the Spirit of America Award. Uh, some of you are, may remember we have um, uh, had past nominees for this, including in 2019, the Ponco Parents Association for all the work that they put in um, organizing and fundraising for the playground project. Uh, it's recommended that uh, this year's nominee be the community ice rink organizers, um, the CZACs, the Hoopers, and the Brandeis family specifically. Uh, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Nobody. Is there a motion uh, to nominate these deserving individuals? So moved. By Caitlin. Is there a second? Absolutely, a second. Second from Councilor Noonan. Any discussion? Seeing none. Deb. Councilor Boucher. Yes. Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councilor Noonan. Yes. Chairman Garvin. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, Matt, do either of the executive session things need to happen tonight? Are they have tos or can we do? If I could grab you for five minutes on yep. the CBA negotiation, that'd be awesome. And uh, you can okay. start my evaluation at your leisure. I'm very comfortable with that part, so. Um, it, that's fine. And I, I can even address that and it won't even take 90 seconds. So, okay. Um, is there... Uh, I'll read it. What's yeah. that? No, hold on. What I'm gonna ask is um, if there's anybody from the public that's hanging up with us here that would like to speak to anything that was not on the agenda because we're going to go into executive session and then we're going to come out and basically the meeting's going to be done. So if there's anybody that wants to speak on something that was not on the agenda, now's your chance. I don't see any hands raised. Um, so with that, uh, go ahead, Jeremy, for a motion to go into executive session. Yeah, I motion that the council enter into an executive session pursuant to Title I MRS um, subsection 4056D to receive an update from the town manager relating to collective bargaining negotiations with the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent, Benevolent Association and Teamster Union number 340 for the Public Works Department. Are we also doing the other part of this, Matt? The town manager evaluation? Yeah. Okay, and Title One MRS subsection 4056A to begin the eva annual evaluation of the town manager. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Second, second, second by Councilor Devereaux. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none. Councilor Boucher? Yes. yes. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Noonan? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, three individuals here uh, from the attendees. I just want to let uh, Rafina, Paul, and Chris know I'm going to uh, remove you from the meeting. Uh, unless you want to, unless you want to jump out yourself, we do it faster than I do. So, uh, Okay. 
and I'm going to now turn off the recording.